and Dale Bosworth, who heads the U.S. Forest Service. It's just over two and a half hours. We're privileged this morning to have the Secretary of Agriculture, Ann Veneman, with us. Uh, she's accompanied by Undersecretary Ray and Chief of the Forest Service, Mr. Bosworth. We're grateful to have all of you with us this morning. And let me point out that this is a bad day for us, and I know a lot of members will feel bad about this because they wanted to talk to all three of you, and we must have four markups going on. Uh, personally, I have one in armed services that's very important to me, and I know the other members do also. So uh, expect a little in and out. And also, let me just respectfully point out that there's been uh, some frustration <coughs> with the Department of Agriculture expressed by members of this committee. And we don't mean to take it out on you today, but uh, we appreciate you being with us and hope you can stand to be with us for the time that we've allotted to this. <clears throat> Let me give my opening statement, and then I understand that uh, someone from the uh, Democratic side will give theirs. And then if anyone else has an opening statement, we'll be happy to hear from you, and members will be coming uh, by uh, periodically. The Forest Service manages about 8.5 percent of total land area in the United States, equating to some 192 million acres of land. These areas are managed by nine regions, 155 national forests, and more than 600 ranger districts. National forest lands are found in 44 states and 739 counties. Out west, we have millions of acres of public domain forests. They say that forest service affects millions of America is a gross understatement. National forest lands are home to a myriad of activities. Americans hunt and fish on national forests, Others quietly reflect <clears throat> in the solitude offered them by towering pines and sparkling brooks. Hikers and campers use developed trails and facilities for recreation. Cities and towns utilize resources from watersheds to provide drinking water to their residents. Indeed, national forests influence our economy, education, commercial, personal, and spiritual well-being. We're here to talk about the future of the Forest Service. It is fair to say that the Forest Service has changed considerably since it was established by Congress in 1905. We need to figure out where it's headed and then see if that's where we want it to be going. And that's our purpose today. I've been doing some interesting reading. It seems that the Forest Service is no longer the agency it used to be. In the beginning, rangers were required to pass rigorous examinations. Among other skills, they had to be able to saddle and pack a horse, build trails and cabins. They had to be able <clears throat> to run a compass line and find their way through the forest both in daylight and darkness. They even had to know how to scale timber, they even had to cook a meal, and most importantly, they were able to eat it afterwards. <clears throat> These skills had to be demonstrated before an applicant could be hired. Experience, not book education, was sought by the Forest Service, and they didn't just hire anyone. They hired the right person for the job. Thus, a force of on-the-grounds experts was created a force they knew the land and what it was best for. Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the Forest Service, wrote that the agency was generally recognized as the best government organization of its day. This happened, he claimed, as a direct result of the agency's purpose and its foundation for, of recognition and responsibility. He outlined several of the reasons why the Forest Service worked so well. Managers were allowed to be innovative and were directly responsible for the land they managed. Those that knew what was best for the land were able to do it, not postponed indefinitely by bureaucracy and red tape. If any man failed to do his job, he was promptly taken out of it. Management policies were dynamic and subject to change if a better way was found. That description is kind of a far cry from today's Forest Service when we realize that things change over the years. But under the previous administration, the agency created mandates, such as the roadless rule, that applied to all lands equally, regardless of their unique situation. Local managers were effectively prohibited from managing the forest. Regulations required assessment of assessments, 
and made even small tasks difficult to achieve. I heard this problem called analyst paralysis. Today, a 34 cent stamp can stop a timber sale. Some employees are no longer responsible for their actions as we saw in the Lynx hair debacle. Beetles and fires are destroying great stands of timber because of the inability of local managers to manage them. Experience and common sense has been replaced by book smarts. Indeed, it looks as though the Forest Service, in many cases, has lost its way. I don't know if there's a specific occasion when this occurred. Perhaps the Forest Service has chosen to follow a sustained version rather than a sustainable version. The axiom that the greatest good for the greatest number in the long term appears to have been downtrodden by a new ideal that places preservation as the top priority and leaves local managers dangling without the tools to manage the national forest. Following this ideal, the Forest Service has replaced management of timber, once thought of as a commodity and a renewable resource, with recreation management. We fully realize that that happens and that those things are occurring, but we're concerned about the way it happens. It's important to realize, however, that none of us want all of the timber on our national forest to be logged. In fact, some of the most beautiful places that I've been are in the national forest. One of the first things I did as a congressman back in 1981 was to sponsor the first and only bill that designated some national forest lands in the state of Utah's wilderness. <coughs> That's the beauty of the multiple use concept coupled with the vision of sustainability. Uses can be balanced and forests can be healthy at the same time. Local economies can benefit and so can hikers. It is not an all or nothing situation like some groups would try to lead us to believe. If the Forest Service has lost its way, it is time to put it back on track while we still have that opportunity. It's going to take a lot of hard work to make this agency the best government organization that it used to be, and I believe it's possible. I believe the right people are in place to do it. Forests must once again be managed for multiple use, access, and sustainability. National forest timber must once again become a commodity. Management tools must be restored to local managers, the people on the ground. Not in Washington should you the say of what happens in local forests. Like the first gentleman said, give them their heads and let them use them. With that said, I would also like to go on record that I have a good relationship with the Forest Service, especially uh, Chief Bosworth, who served as the regional forest in Ogden, Utah. I also have a close working relationship with forest sur uh, supervisors and district rangers. And then I know that they have the best of intentions of the Forest Service. I'm pleased to have them in these leadership positions. Uh, uh, Chief, I think you've got some awfully good people that work for you. Let's let them lead. We've worked together on a number of issues over the years, and I hope that this relationship will continue to be fruitful. You know, let, let me just point out that uh, no disrespect to anybody over the years, but access is a big deal. And people in America want access to their ground. I had a man come up to me and put his face right in mine the other day, and he said, read the Constitution, Mr. Chairman. The first words are, we the people. And we, the people, want to use the public grounds of America. And I'm almost embarrassed to go some places in my home district, uh, state, in my home district, because people will jump all over me and say, how come we didn't have any input when that road was closed? How come we didn't have any input when someone ruined this thing on grazing or timber or whatever it may be? And so, as I, I, I mentioned to the secretary yesterday, and I apologize, but I still remember 1981, when Ronald Reagan is in the White House and they invited me to come down and there was uh, Secretary Block and Secretary Watt were there. And he said, there will be no more war on the West. It's we're going to come, let us reason together. And he said, when you go out there, it's not them and us, it's we're all Americans. And when you walk in with your green truck and your badge and your gun and all that stuff, keep in mind that a lot of those people have been there a long time and they know a lot about the forest and they want to use the forest. They do want access, and they do want use of the forest, and, and, and I sustain that idea. Uh, further than that, though, I, I know all of you have been there a relatively short time. We appreciate you coming today and putting up with this committee, which is probably here to harass you and badger you a little bit, but uh, we, we know that you're all big and strong and can handle that. With that said, uh, Mr. Kildee, are you the spokesman, or is Mr. Kind the spokesman? I turned to my friend from Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Madam Secretary for your presence today and uh, bringing us up to speed on this very important issue. But first of all, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to visit the Badger State on Earth Day and meet with a lot of the state and local officials and also uh, the conversations we've now had. We've been battling a very important problem in the state of Wisconsin. For the first time, chronic wasting disease has been detected east of the Mississippi, affecting our deer herd. And just to put this in economic perspective, 
Everyone knows that deer hunting is fairly popular in the upper Midwest. In the state of Wisconsin alone, based on 96 statistics, it's a $2.6 billion economic impact for the entire state. And now we've detected it east of the Mississippi. It's been detected west of the Continental Divide. It's sweeping across the continent. And we look forward to working with you and your department in regards to perhaps some emergency funds to get out ahead of the curve on eradication programs and how we can best uh, implement prevention programs for this. So I thank you for your attention to that matter. Now, in regards to the subject of your testimony today, uh, the roadless conservation rule, this is a very important rule. And many of us are somewhat chagrined and, and a little disappointed in how slow the, uh, uh, the department has in implementing the roadless conservation rule. It's been almost a year to the date when uh, you had indicated uh, that you're going to put a hold on going forward on the new rule. While at the same time, you stated that providing roadless protection for our national force is the right thing to do and asserted your commitment to roadless protection, yet you wanted to reopen the process, a process that had countless uh, uh, public comment period with over 600 public meetings, resulting in over 1.6 million documents produced on the uh, roadless conservation rule. And for many of us, we felt that there was plenty of vetting throughout the course of that process and now are uh, somewhat uh, surprised that the administration is so slow in regards to moving forward on this very, very important rule. And from my perspective, I think it is sensible uh, to move forward on the rule for a host of environmental and fiscal reasons. Over 383,000 miles of road crisscross our national forest today, and these roads have generated an $8.4 billion repair backlog, yet the Forest Service receives less than 20 percent of its annual maintenance needs. And it's the taxpayer that is ultimately saddled with the cost of this maintenance. And until this backlog is dealt with sufficiently, it makes no fiscal sense to be building more roads and adding to future backlog problems until we can get a grip on existing problems as they exist. And that is just routine repair and maintenance on the roads right now, you know, resulting in this $8 billion plus uh, backlog. Roads also generate significant public safety and environmental problems, increased fire risk and increased chance of landslides and slope failures that endanger watersheds and fish habitat. The flip side of this problem is that the unroaded areas have enormous ecological benefits as fish and wildlife habitat, as bulwarks against invasive species, and as sources of drinking water, just to name a few. And that's why many of us believe that the time has come to move forward on the roadless conservation rule. And uh, uh, we appreciate your attendance. We appreciate the focus you've given to this important uh, subject. And we'll look forward to your testimony today. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. gentlemen. Uh, you probably noticed that our friend Charlie Norwood from Georgia is sitting with us. I ask unanimous consent that Charlie Norwood can participate in this meeting and sit on the dais. Is there objection? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walden had an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary, colleagues, and guests. I cannot emphasize strongly enough the desperate state of affairs in our forests and our rural communities. Report after report produced by the General Accounting Office have consistently sounded the alarm that our national forests in the West are at critical risk to catastrophic fire. And indeed, in my district and throughout the West, we've seen fires that burn hotter and hotter every year. Meanwhile, at a time when our forests are choked with trees, the people in the small towns they live in are being choked economically. Some mills in my district have resorted to importing logs from as far away as Alaska and New Zealand just to keep the communities in which they operate alive. Mr. Ray, I know you understand this as you were recently in one of those communities, probably the most distressed in my district, John Day, Oregon. You heard firsthand of the failure of the Forest Service to be able to prepare sales that will survive a court challenge. While I'm certain the dedicated people in the Forest Service who want to properly manage this national resource must be frustrated at their inability to get anything accomplished that meets a court challenge, I dare say that frustration is a flicker in the day compared to the lightning in the night frustration of the people who are losing their jobs and their communities. Why does it take years and years to get approval to remove even dead, burned, and diseased trees? I highly doubt there's a member of this committee who would wait three or four years or perhaps forever to replace a dead tree in their backyard. In my district, the federal forests are our backyard, and if this were public housing, the press would call the government a slumlord. I know you share my concerns, and I know you're working to try to find solutions. Where the Forest Service has been able to get approval to properly manage the forest, we're able to control fire and produce healthier stands. And I look forward to hearing more about this administration's charter forest concept 
says, I believe it may hold hope for managing our forests in a healthier way and in a way that will stop the death of our timber-dependent communities. I also look forward to your comments on the implementation of the Northwest Forest Plan. The promises made to the people of the Northwest simply have not been kept. The facts are clear on that. The issue is what can we do to meet the goals that were promised to the people in the Northwest? And given the incredible fire danger we face in my district, I want to also get on the record an assurance that if various conditions are met, the Forest Service will permanently keep the tanker base in Medford open. As you know, both of our Senators, Ron Wyden and Gordon Smith, and Congressman DeFazio and I are committed to working with you and this administration to keep this base open and operating. Finally, and right now most importantly, I would like to solicit your comments regarding the terrible situation afflicting the good people of the Klamath Basin. As you may know, this committee, especially Chairman Hansen and Mr. Young, work closely with me and with Chairman Combest and the Ag Committee to earmark $50 million in the Farm Bill's EQIP program, specifically for conservation projects in the basin. In addition, I'm pleased to announce that we were able to get the legislation passed by this committee, uh, co-sponsored by my, co my colleague, Mr. DeFazio, and passed by the House, inserted in the Farm Bill to require a study of fish passage issues at Chiliquin Dam which presently blocks 95 percent of the habitat for the sucker fish, which are endangered. And finally, um, the legislation, the Farm Bill legislation, includes some $750 million in conservation funds, water conservation funds, Madam Secretary, that could really provide us with the funding we need to solve the problems in the Klamath Basin. I commend you and your staff for the great work you've done to help solve the problems in that basin. As you know, the water was cut off to 1,400 farm families. And while we still don't have final information on what kind of flows we'll see this year for them, we're waiting for the biological opinion from NIMPS. I know that the situation is severe. I also know that for decades and decades, literally, projects have been identified that will improve water quality and water quantity, that will improve habitat, that will improve wetlands, that will improve the environment and make sure we have water for the people. What we've lacked is a commitment uh, from the government to go in and actually fund and, and, and implement these projects. Uh, and certainly there are Native American projects and issues that must be dealt with in the basin. So I, I look forward to continuing to work with you and to learning more about how you might be able to access these various pots of money in the Farm Bill that we'll vote on tomorrow to help solve the problems in the Klamath Basin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your continued and strong support of our efforts to stand up for the farmers and ranchers and improve the problems in the basin, and for your willingness and that work and your staff to hold the hearing in, in Klamath and to hold the hearing back here on the NAS study and to help us find real solutions that will work for the fish, the waterfowl, and the farmers and ranchers. And with that, I, I appreciate your courtesy in allowing me to share those remarks. I thank the gentleman. One, one further opening statement, and then we'll go to the Secretary. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, I, wa I didn't uh, have an opening statement to start with, but I did want to comment on a couple of things that were just said, one dealing with the roadless rule. And contrary to some people's perception, uh, it was not the Bush administration that gutted the roadless rule, as some groups have uh, indicated, uh, some environmental groups and others have indicated that that's the case. It was a federal judge in Boise, Idaho, that put an injunction on the roadless rule because it was put into effect uh, illegally. And on May 10, 2001, the U.S. District Court in Boise issued a preliminary injunction in joining the Forest Service from implementing all aspects of the roadless area conservation rule. The court based its decision in part on concerns related to the public's review, namely that the court conclusively finds that the comment period was grossly inadequate and thus deprived the public of any meaningful dialogue or input into the process. Since that time, uh, the Forest Service, as I understand it, has put together the Forest Roads Working Group, which is a, a group of uh, all stakeholders, uh, land users, uh, environmental groups, trying to work on this rule to try to come to some compromise that will work. And I understand, uh, and you can verify this during your testimony if you would, that during that time period, since this uh, rule was enjoined by the federal judge, that there has not been one road built in a roadless area, nor has there been one tree cut in a roadless area that was designated before. So the, uh, the claim that somehow the administration is, is uh, gutting the Forest Service and the, uh, and the roadless rule that was proposed by the, the Clinton administration, I think, is just false. So uh, I wanted to get that on the record. Thank I you, Thank Mr. you. I didn't mean to exclude Mr. DeFazio. I apologize. Secretary, uh, uh, Chief, and uh, uh, Secretary Ray. Um, I, I've had correspondence, uh, uh, Madam Secretary, with uh, both the Chief, uh, his predecessor Chief, uh, with uh, Assistant Secretary Ray and his predecessor, 
uh, on an issue that uh, I've been um, trying to get the attention of uh, the past administration and hopefully yours for nearly a decade now. Uh, the Clinton Forest Plan was uh, destined uh, to fail uh, in part uh, because it, it based a substantial uh, amount of its harvest in, in old growth timber, which was always the heart of the controversy. Uh, at the time of the drafting of the Clinton Forest Plan, I attempted uh, to get the administration and uh, the uh, scientists and Lord Thomas uh, to uh, look at uh, a alternative which would uh, reserve uh, the remaining old growth and that but move to uh, more dispersed forestry over a larger land base. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, work has been done by Jerry Franklin and, and other scientists uh, developing this sort of a uh, approach on uh, uh, some uh, forests in the Northwest uh, for different reasons. It's credible environmentally. You can get the same outputs. You can actually get uh, more reliable uh, timber outputs uh, and uh, potentially uh, certainly uh, greater numbers than you're getting now. And you don't have the controversy, controversy over the harvesting of old growth. Um, we have hundreds of thousands, millions of acres, particularly in the coast range, uh, that are reaching a critical point. If we don't go in there and do uh, a, uh, some thinning in those, uh, in those areas, you'll never be able to go in and thin uh, because uh, the, tr the, the trees won't be able to develop uh, the root systems. I would urge uh, any, uh, I'm certain the chief is familiar with this. I don't know if Secretary uh, Ray has made this trip yet, but the Forest Service has a great trip where they can take you out into the Sayuslaw Forest and, and just by hiking uh, less than a mile, you can see an unthinned stand and trees that are about 10 inches in diameter and a barren ground. You can go to a thin stand and see trees that are 13, 14 inches in diameter with, with, uh, you know, with ground cover up about two feet. And then you can go to a more robustly thin stand, see even larger trees with stuff growing over your head. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands millions of acres uh, that need that sort of approach. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, this is something that where I believe you can bring together environmental groups and industry. You can get out a viable product. You can manage these forests back toward a, uh, you know, a more sustainable ecological basis. Uh, and in, a, in effect, you put off the controversy over what they're going to be whether you're going to just manage them to become old growth again someday for 20 or 30 years uh, till the next generation. And I know I won't be here then. So I'm very desirous that we take uh, a look at this approach. And, and I, I, I just wanted to bring it to your attention. The, uh, the gentleman on either side of you have uh, both discussed this with me. And I would really hope that we can get the administration focused on this. Thank you. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Oregon for that very interesting statement. Uh, <laughs> We're grateful to have you again. I appreciate you being here. And uh, we're pretty informal sometime in this place. And if you want to turn to your companions for a comment, by all means, please do it. Madam Secretary, we turn the time to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it's, uh, it's a great privilege for me to appear before you today uh, to discuss our vision for the uh, USDA's Forest Service. The Forest Service, as you know, is a vital a part of the department, and the future of the agency has great significance, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, to all Americans, especially those, though, who work, who recreate, who live in or near our national forests. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm accompanied today by Mark Ray, our Undersecretary for Natural Resources and Environment, and our Chief of the Forest Service, Dale Bosworth, uh, who is a second-generation member of the Forest Service with his son also involved. And these two gentlemen, along with their whole team, are doing a terrific job um, helping to manage this very valuable resource. At the outset, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your support of the Forest Service role in making the Olympic Winter Games in Utah an outstanding and memorable event. Two signature events, the Downhill and the Super G, took place at the Snow Basin Ski Resort located in the um, Wasatch Cache National Forest. Our intent was to provide Olympics-related activities on the National Forest that were not only thrilling but also safe and environmentally responsible. I believe that we achieved all three objectives. 
Uh, and I was very pleased to at least share the opening ceremonies of those Olympics and to celebrate with our Forest Service people the success of their um, participation in this mission. I also want to note how proud I was to go to New York City less than a month after September 11th and to see our Forest Service incident management teams working side by side with the New York City Fire Department to help in those as they um, dealt with the devastation of the fires and the collapse of the World Trade Center. Many people don't know this important role that our Forest Service played and our Forest Service firefighter plays in helping to manage the incidents in the, in the New York City following the uh, September 11th incidents. Our goal is for the Department of Agriculture, including our, all our agencies in the for, in, and including the Forest Service, to be a world-class provider of goods and services to the American people. The Forest Service has hardworking and dedicated employees. It maintains the world's premier wildland wild firefighting force. It maintains high quality recreation to hundreds of millions of visitors each year. National forests are the source of clean water to hundreds of communities throughout our country. Forest Service scientists are world leaders in forest and rangeland research. The agency maintains the oldest and most comprehensive forest census in the world. And through its ongoing partnership with state foresters, the Forest Service assists thousands of non-federal forest land owners. These are only a few of the many successes of our Forest Service. Yet while we have much to be proud of, we also recognize that we have much to do. My comments today will focus on five key areas, managing our forests and rangelands, cooperation across government, process gridlock, accountability, and reconnecting with local communities. Although this list is not exhaustive, it includes the most critical areas for improving the Forest Service in the long run. In 1960, Congress enacted the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act, thereby defining the mission of the Forest Service. The law man mandated that the Forest Service manage all of the various renewable re surface resources of the national forests so that they are utilized in combination that will best meet the needs of the American people. The ability to actively manage our forests and rangelands lies at the heart of the Forest Service's most multiple use. 73 million acres of national forest land is at moderate to high risk from unacceptably damaging wildfire. 70 million acres are susceptible to destruction from insects and disease. Invasive species infestations are increasing. Our transportation infrastructure and recreational facilities are deteriorating and, need, and in need of repair. As these conditions worsen, it will become increasingly difficult to meet the multiple needs of maintaining healthy ecosystems, protecting rural communities, and supporting the public users of our national forests. A renewed emphasis on proactive management is the first step toward reversing this trend. Management by doing nothing is not an option. We must take proactive measures to improve forest health, restore watersheds, improve our transportation and recreation infrastructure, and address other serious resource needs. Proactive management can also provide wood, forage, energy, and other important products. By emphasizing what we leave on the land rather than what we take, we can ensure that our active management will be environmentally responsible while producing forests and rangelands that are more resilient, productive, and better able to provide goods and services and other important benefits to people and communities. Key to the success of the Forest Service is its ability to cooperate with other agencies to accomplish its mission. Our joint effort with the Department of Interior to implement the National Fire Plan is an excellent example of our commitment to establish a seamless delivery of services across government. 
On April 10th, the Departments of Agriculture and the Interior announced the creation of the Wild Land Fire Leadership Council to achieve consistent implementation of the goals, action, and policies of the National Fire Plan. This council oversees the development of consistent fire management plans, a uniform set of outcome-based performance measures, common data elements and reporting systems, unified procedures for the delivery of an effective hazardous fuels recreation program, or uh, I'm sorry, hazardous fuels reduction program, and a unified preparedness model and a number of other significant measures to ensure consistent management uh, between the departments and across the landscape. In addition, last August, the two departments, in cooperation with the Western Governors Association, Tribal Interests, the National Association of State Foresters, and the National Association of Counties, adopted a 10-year wildfire strategy, establishing a new collaborative approach to reducing wildfire risks to communities and the environment. The implementation plan for the 10-year strategy will be finalized soon and will establish, for the first time, a uniform set of interdepartmental goals, performance measures, and tasks for improving prevention and suppression, reducing hazardous fuels to protect communities, restoring fire-adapted ecosystems, and promoting community well-being. Perhaps our greatest challenge is to address what our Chief Bosworth describes as analysis paralysis. This is caused by overlapping statutory requirements, unnecessarily complicated internal rules and procedures. Several decades of court-made law and a proliferation of appeals and litigation have combined to substantially delay and increase the cost of our decision-making processes. Each year, the Forest Service processes more NEPA documents to support management decisions than any other government agency. According to Forest Service estimates, the process and paperwork required to, one, complete these documents, two, meet other statutory and regulatory requirements, three, and three, prepare agency decisions to withstand possible appeals and litigation, account for between 40 and 60 percent of the total time spent on management activities. This does not include the time associated with appeals and litigation, which frequently ensue once decisions are made. Frequently, the onerous process does little to improve the quality of agency decisions. The Forest Service is preparing a report to the Chief on this process gridlock. The report will provide a diagnosis of the factors that contribute most directly to uh, 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 unnecessary and counterproductive procedural delays. We hope it will stimulate a constructive dialogue that will help us identify our most serious problems and solve them together. Consistent with the President's management agenda, the Department and the Forest Service are committed to improving our financial and performance accountability to the Congress and to the public. First and foremost, we, want, we are committed to fidelity in the management of taxpayer dollars. To that end, we have committed significant departmental resources to helping the Forest Service and the Department achieve a clean audit opinion. The Forest Service has already made significant progress in reconciling the agency's cash records and accounting for real property. It is a priority to achieve a clean audit for the Forest Service, and our Chief Financial Officer and Undersecretary Ray are actively engaged in assisting with process reforms to achieve that goal. We are also committed to improving the way Forest, the Forest Service measures its performance. As demonstrated by our progress under the fire plan, the agency is moving aggressively to account for its accomplishments using meaningful outcome-based performance measures that fully account for what it achieves with each investment. We are also working across government to integrate the Forest Service's performance measures with those of other land management agencies. Our progress is somewhat limited by the agency's overly complex structure that emphasizes programs <coughs> over performance. The agency appreciates the assistance 
Congress gave to begin to address the issues during the 2001 appropriations process. We would like to continue to work with this committee and the appropriations committees to simplify the Forest Service budget while placing greater emphasis on performance. By focusing on performance, we expect the agency to measure, measurably improve the quality and the quantity and quality of goods and services it delivers to the public per unit of investment. To succeed in the long run, the Forest Service must establish and maintain strong ties to local communities. Our recent success with the Olympics demonstrates what can be accomplished with the agency and when the agency and the communities come together as partners. Community-based management can and must be a bedrock principle within the Forest Service. We have made significant progress towards strengthening our relationships with local communities. For example, we have worked hard to fully implement the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act. Over the last year, we have chartered 65 local resource advisory committees which will work with counties and local forest managers uh, to identify and implement community-based resource management projects. We are receiving positive reports from all over the country about the success of these committees. Local collaboration is also a fundamental principle of the 10-year comprehensive wildfire strategy. The strategy emphasizes that key decisions on management priorities, resource allocation, and project implementation are best made in connection with communities at the local level. Finally, we are working to deliver more local contracts across all of the agency's mission areas, particularly in fire prevention and suppression. Through our efforts, through the efforts of the Forest Products Lab, we are also promoting alternative markets and uses for the smaller diameter material and the biomass that comes from thinning and fuels reduction projects. The lab has actively cooperated with small businesses in rural, and in rural communities to develop new technologies for producing furniture, home construction materials, and other value-added products. As uh, Congressman Kind indicated, we highlighted many of these in innovations during our recent, recent Earth Day celebration at the lab's Advanced Housing Technology Center in Madison, Wisconsin. In conclusion, let me reemphasize our most basic objectives. We are committed to managing and restoring our forests and rangelands, protecting communities for risk of catastrophic fire, wildfires, and building the Forest Service into a world-class provider of goods and services to the American public. This will require, at a minimum, a sustained effort in the five areas that we've identified. We look forward to working with the committee and with you, Mr. Chairman, on these, uh, these and other priorities the committee might identify as critical to the long-term success of the Forest Service. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to answering your questions and those of the members of the committee. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Secretary. We appreciate your comments. Uh, I especially appreciate the kind words you said about the Utah Olympics. Uh, I guess they really pulled one off. Yeah, to me, it turned out very, very successful. and. Uh, Without the help of the Forest Service, we'd have never had that downhill you're referring to, and I appreciate that good work. And besides that, we now have a world-class uh, new ski resort, which, of course, is far superior than anything we have in Colorado. God, I know. <laughs> uh, let me just... Keep in mind, Mr. Chairman, we don't buy our snow. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I better let all this go with my two colleagues from Colorado sitting here. I just had to say that with my good friend Scott sitting here. Uh, Pull the wind out of the West. Yeah. And uh, the new member of the Ethics Committee, the other gentleman from Colorado, uh, Mr. Udall. Uh, let me thank you for that and, and point out that uh, most of us have got markups. I, they're calling me to come over to the Armed Services right now. But I would like to submit some questions, and I would really uh, appreciate your answer to some of those. And let me hit the toughest one that this committee has brought up many, many times. I'd like you folks to tell us why this should be under Ag, Forest Service, and not under Interior. Uh, that's one of those tough issues, and I, and I understand that. 
Let me also point out to members of the committee, we've got a lot of members here, and I'm sure you all want to uh, have questions. I would hope you could hold it within your five-minute uh, period of time and keep in mind that the acoustics in this room are horrible. Uh, the one down to 1324, which is not all torn up, is a little better, so if we could kind of hold down the chatter, it would be helpful as uh, questions are asked. And I'm going to turn this over to the chairman of the Subcommittee on Forest, Forest Health, uh, Mr. Scott McKinnis from Colorado and uh, he can manage the meeting, and I appreciate you doing that, and I, I withdraw the statement I made about your, uh, <laughs> your, your areas in that, of skiing. And with that, uh, sir, it's Thank yours. You. Thank, Thank you, you again. Mr. Chair, as I've often said, the only mistake we made in Colorado was not drawing our border a little further to the west to pick up that great <laughs> state of Utah. But, uh, Thank you. I, I'm going to, uh, under the chairman's time, he did ask that question. I think it's a question, uh, Madam Secretary, that's uh, uh, obviously logical, and I think it's a question of interest to the rest of the committee. So we're going to go ahead and utilize the rest of Mr. Hansen's time and would ask that you answer the question about why is the Forest Service under the Department of Agriculture instead of under the Department of Interior, and what is the future of that arrangement? Uh, and what do you see? You would proceed. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to answer this question because it is one that I, I think is confusing to the public as well. And uh, as you know, around the turn of the century, Teddy Roosevelt uh, determined that the Forest Service as a um, multiple use agency and one that uh, uh, harvested uh, a substantial amount of uh, product from public lands uh, should be contained in the Department of Agriculture. And so the decision was made to uh, place it in the Department of Agriculture. The Forest Service has continued to remain a multiple use agency and as I indicated in my opening statement, we continue to uh, operate uh, the forest lands for multiple uses. I, I think that the issue is much more important to look at from the standpoint of how public lands are operated um, rather than where it, where it may or may not be located and I think um, one of the very important things that has happened, particularly under this administration, is the commitment that we have to work together in a seamless way with our friends who manage other public lands in this country. And that's been particularly apparent as we have uh, dealt with the National Fire Plan. Uh, as I indicated, we worked with the National Governors Association to sign a plan last summer establishing the National Fire Plan. We have the uh, National Fire Center, which is located in Bo Boise, o Idaho, which uh, I, I recently had, or last summer, also had the opportunity to visit, again, a joint project of the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture, where we seamlessly deal with fire issues throughout the country. Uh, we just established this new Wildland Fire Management Council, which Secretary Norton and I announced together. Uh, again, our fire management in this country uh, is being put together in a completely seamless way. And it seems to me that's what the American public ought to be concerned about, is how we're managing rather than where the boxes are placed. I would note also that there are some very important areas where the Forest Service overlaps with other parts of the Department of Agriculture, clearly in the uh, resource areas and the management of private forest lands, uh, which we do in conjunction with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. We work closely with other conservation activities in the department through the Forest Service. Many of our research activities uh, are, uh, are, are work with uh, the Agricultural Research Service and the Forest Service researchers. We are finding an increasing overlap uh, with the, the duties and the op, uh, obligations the, the, of the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and the Forest Service as we seek to manage uh, increasing numbers of pests and invasive species in forest lands, some of which also impact our agricultural lands. And so we find that uh, uh, we indeed uh, do really appreciate having the National Forest Service in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, it plays a very valuable role, and we are continuing to uh, expand that role. We're now, under the guise of Homeland Security, for example, using these Forest Service incident management teams more broadly as we're looking to manage uh, um, pest and disease outbreaks, for example. 
the Forest Service is now a full partner with our Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. So I, I can say that uh, we are certainly very proud uh, to have the Forest Service as part of the Department of Agriculture, and we think it's a very valuable partner in many missions of our, of our department. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Let me uh, begin by, first of all, commending you on the Fire Council. As you know, that's absolutely critical. I think that coordination. I can tell you in my district, uh, as you know, we have a couple fires going right now. We had the number one priority last week. We'll have a number of others that uh, occur out there. But over the weekend, we had a fire in a small town called Westcliff. And uh, some of the local people commented about the Forest Service, saying that it was they could not believe the response. Within an hour, they had smoke jumpers in there. I mean, it really seems that you've gotten your act together. Now, who knows what this season holds? But, uh, you know, our 1,000-year fuel measurements and things like that show we're in for a tough year. I want to commend you on that. I also want to commend the Forest Service. You mentioned early on that uh, uh, you, you had very good employees, and, and I think that's absolutely right. We have a lot of dedicated professionals out there. We had a committee hearing earlier in the year where we had a, an ex-Forest Service employee uh, talk about all the threats that Forest Service people had received and uh, kids at school received threats. Uh, we've not been able to verify any of that kind of testimony. In fact, in my community, and, and it's very controversial because of the 120, approximately 120 communities I have, 119 of them are completely surrounded by public lands, much of which is forest. Our relationships with our local people are excellent, and I commend you, uh, uh, commend the uh, uh, Forest Service for that. I want to uh, uh, also mention that we've just completed the uh, White River National Forest. The plan's been signed and results will be released here pretty soon. Uh, one individual in particular, uh, Rick Cables, uh, the regional guy out there, uh, was excellent. I think he has done very, very well in bringing the parties together. To give you an idea how controversial this was, Madam Secretary, Ten year, 15 years ago when we did the plan, we had 200 comments. This time we had 40,000. Now, a lot of those were machine-generated, computer-generated, but a lot of them were not. And uh, it, it, it took a real balancing act, including uh, I felt so deeply about it for the first time in the history of Congress. I, I actually, as a congressman, wrote my own force plan, which was done by, as you know, by professionals and so on, but I felt very seriously. But anyway, I thought that uh, that's worth mentioning. Those are the good things. I need to talk to you about these biologists on the link survey. Uh, as you know, the Forest Service uh, did not met out any kind of discipline. In fact, as I understand, these employees may have received uh, bonuses for performance or pay raises. Uh, Jack Ward Thomas, who was Bill Clinton, the President Clinton's or, uh, head of the Forest Service, uh, spoke the other day and said that this necessitates accountability. And I would just urge that you take a personal look at that and see if the punishment uh, fit the uh, misbehavior. Accountability is absolutely crucial, as you know, for our biologists or our professionals. And all we need is one bad apple in the bushel, and as you know, it throws a disdain on the rest of the bushel. It's the same thing here. When we speak of good employees, we have a couple employees that commit obvious wrongs. And if we don't address that in an appropriate fashion, and I'm not being critical of you, you've come in after, after the uh, situation. <clears throat> also, I. I would like to uh, uh, ask, and by the way, this clock, I have my own five minutes. That thing's not right. Uh, that was the chairman's five minutes before, and now I get my own five. But anyway, uh, as, as you know, I'd, I'd, I'd in, in uh, east of the, yeah, it's Green good. again. Yeah, that's what I like. Yeah, I'd, in, the, in the east, you have uh, east of the Mississippi River is 73 or 75 percent of the uh, a surface water flow in the country. Up in the northeast or northwest section, you get about 13 percent. But in the west, which consists of about half the land mass in the country, we get 14 percent. Water is, is uh, uh, in the east, a lot of times they worry about drainage water. In the west, we worry about being able to store that water. We have lots of opposition against water storage in this country. People who uh, don't understand it, people who are not dependent upon it, we use it for flood control. We use it for uh, uh, generation of electricity. We use it for reservoirs. The first dam in the country we know of was the Anasazi Indians down in the southwest part of the state. I mean, there's lots of history to it. The state that I live in, Colorado, the, the, the average elevation, we're the highest place on the continent. So a lot of states depend on us for that water. 
And in the past, the federal government has always recognized the states negotiating between states. Well, under the previous administration, the Forest Service came in with something called bypass flows. And I just would urge and would like a comment, and I, and, and I don't want to catch you off guard because it's a complicated issue, but I would urge that, you, that, that the Forest Service consider very carefully that before they jump the gun and put in these things like bypass flows, that they understand the unintended, while it may be good faith intended, they understand the implications and the unintended consequences that happen when you deal with water law in the West, which is uniquely different than water law in the East. And of course, this year with our drought, the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years and only 100 years because that's when we started keeping records, uh, this is the cooperation between our federal government and those of us out there really demand attention to this multiple use concept and the critical nature. As you know, out there in the West, we have all the water, on a typical year, we have all the water we need for about 90 days of spring runoff. The rest of the year, we gotta, if we don't have it stored, we don't get it. And the only way we're going to get through this year is because in the past we had cooperation with our federal agencies in building reservoir projects. So I'm very concerned about the uh, uh, bypass flow um, and uh, would ask that you, uh, uh, you know, take a look at that. If you have any comments, I'd be happy on the subjects that I've just covered. I'd be happy to have you respond. Well, thank you. Um, well, you've covered a lot. Let me see if I, know, I can I touch on a, on a few of these. Um, uh, first, um, uh, thank you for our co the, your comments on the on the council. The council actually does meet this afternoon. And uh, beginning to, uh, particularly with the fire season as it's now beginning, I think it's important that this council meet uh, and really look at the issues we're facing today as well as how we coordinate for the long term. Um, uh, on the links issue, I, I, as you know, both Secretary Norton and I immediately upon learning of this issue did ask our inspector generals to look into this as uh, an investigative matter, matter, which they have been doing. Uh, we are uh, our forest service is in the in the process of reviewing the report and looking at actions. I do know, however, from talking with the chief, that the person that appears, at least from the forest service side, that was most intimately involved with this issue has retired, so is no longer with the service. Um, the issue of water storage and uh, uh, in the West, as you know, I come from the West. Um, and I come from California where water uh, is a very, very big issue, particularly the availability and storage of water and how it impacts agriculture in the forest. And so it's something and, that... And you're the beneficiaries of some very good, clean Rocky Mountain spring water. We recognize right. that. <laughs> um, and I was recently in Colorado, and uh, the issue of bypass flows was an issue that came up during our conversations uh, in our roundtable with uh, a number of farmers and members of the of the community and and I must say the whole issue of water I, I could have been in my home state of California because the issues are so similar between our two states but I think it's important to recognize that we have to work with the states as a forest service closely with the states and the and the water rights holders to determine in a cooperative way uh, how to resolve these water rights issues. There are a number of water rights claims that we are trying to work through in the, in the Forest Service. Uh, and we are putting a priority on trying to work through these cases as expeditiously as possible to create the fairest outcomes for all of the parties involved. And I think that is the best way that we can work through these issues, is to involve all the stakeholders to work closely with everyone and to try to come up with the fairest solution that we possibly can. Um, so, and I finally want to want to simply uh, reiterate the value of our employees um, as I indicated in my opening statement, I think it's extremely important uh, that we have employees that are involved in local communities. Um, we have to involve local communities in local forest decisions because, as you know, uh, and I certainly know, having grown up going to a national forest every summer during my childhood, every forest is unique. And so we have to have local input into these decisions and local involvement with communities and people with the Forest Service, and that is absolutely a goal of our department. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Ansley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you being here. We're delighted to have a chance to talk with the administration about these important issues. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a, a general question about the uh, ability for your agencies to enjoy the trust of the American people. You have a very difficult job. You're between various, a lot of different forces. And it seems to me keeping and winning that trust is very important on whatever you think of any of these issues. And I'm very concerned about that right now for a variety of reasons. Because I think a review, even a cursory review, of the administration's environmental policies have created a very, very uh, significant mood of distrust of the administration. And I want to just ask you about some of those things. I want to review them just quickly. First, the administration uh, abandons an environmental policy in their energy policy and designs it with the oil and gas industry and then refuses to tell us about their contacts with the oil and gas industry. Second, the administration waives environmental rules regarding hard rock mining. Third, the administration refuses to work with the international community to do something about global warming. Fourth, the administration uh, attempts to essentially defund the Superfund Trust Fund by not implementing the revenue sources. Fifth, the administration wants to drill for oil in the Arctic in the refuge created by Dwight David Eisenhower. Sixth, the administration wants to weaken the clean air rules at the very time where there is an epidemic of asthma in our children in this country. Seventh, the administration we hear is attempting to weaken the mountaintop removal rules on coal mining. Eighth, the administration apparently is intent on weakening wetlands mitigation rules. Ninth, the administration refuses to defend the roadless area bill, a rule, a rule adopted after 1.2 or 1.6 million comments by the American people, despite the specific promise of the Attorney General Ashcroft to defend that rule. Now, I think a cursory review of this environmental failure would be described as disappointing, and I think in arguably can be characterized as the worst environmental failure of any administration in American history. And that will leave that to argument. But I think it's created a significant distrust of the American people of the administration's ability to act as a fair broker for these precious national resources. And I think that's very difficult in the discharge of your duties. And I realize you are not responsible for a lot of of the failures I've just alluded to. Your agencies were not involved in a significant numbers of those. But that distrust, I think, washes over to your duties. So I'll just ask you a general question. Why should the administration trust your agencies when it comes to the discharge of environmental law? And what do you believe you can do to regain or win that trust? And that's a general question to any and all who would like to answer it. Well, I think <laughs> certainly, um, I think it's an unfair statement to say that this administration has not paid attention to the environment. I think that uh, we have done uh, a tremendous amount, and I work very closely with both uh, Secretary Norton and Administrator Whitman as we work through a number of environmental issues. And in fact, uh, uh, I just had them both uh, over to our department for a joint event uh, earlier this week. And I know that we are all working um, to do the right thing with regard to the environment. Um, let me just say that on the agriculture side, um, the environmental groups have strongly supported our department as we put out our book last year on food and agriculture policy, Taking Stock for a New Century, because it made it so emphasized the environmental interface with agriculture and the role of our forests. Uh, I think that, uh, that that book is an example of how strongly we take our environmental responsibilities. Uh, we have a farm bill that will be voted on soon. That farm bill will have more money for environmental spending than any farm bill in the history of this country. Uh, and I certainly think that that's something that uh, uh, we are proud of and something the administration supported uh, and something that uh, is important part of our environmental record. Um, in the energy policy, 
we have a strong emphasis on renewable resources. We have a strong emphasis on wanting to be less dependent on foreign sources of energy, which is why the energy policy looks for domestic sources, uh, not only in terms of new uh, sources of, of oil and gas, but also renewable fuse sources from agriculture. Uh, and both the energy policy, the energy, the bill that's been passed by the Senate has a renewable energy standard, something the administration supports, and the and the farm bill is going to have an energy title for the first time. Um, and I think uh, all of these things are indications of of a strong emphasis on uh, balanced environmental policy that will provide benefits to the environment while we have the best utilization of our resources. That's what this administration is about, is about finding the right balance. And I think that uh, um, the characterization um, that you have described is not a fair characterization of this administration's environmental policy. Thank you. And uh, I don't have the chairman's same time piece, so I'll have to defer to the next round. Thank you. I would point out to the ranking member that you did go over your time about the same time I went over my time and remind the ranking member that the time previous to my comments were those of the <laughs> chairman answering his question. We can't even agree on so, the time. Uh, I, it's disappointing. <laughs> we agree on who's chairman. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Gallagher, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Secretary Veneman. It's uh, it's uh, refreshing to have a fellow Californian uh, at uh, the cabinet level, particularly representing the agriculture interests in this country. Uh, for all too long, uh, I think we've had too few people that really understood agriculture in the West that we have today. And uh, it is uh, very welcome uh, to, to my constituency and I think to the entire West. Uh, I want to personally take uh, just a minute and thank you for your help with the glassy wing sharpshooter issue. Uh, my good friend George Rodonovich, who has been a, a stalwart representative of the wine industry, uh, has, I'm sure, brought that to your attention. Uh, and, and we've had good success with your help in, in declaring the emergency status in California. I would like an opportunity at some point in the immediate future to discuss with you the issues beyond the wine industry. Uh, certainly the citrus industry is, is one that has been identified, but the one industry that I think has been uh, somewhat uh, unrepresented, and, it, and it's probably due to their own lack of, of, uh, of organization, is the nursery business. We have three of the largest nursery growers in the country, and while the, the, uh, this issue does not have a direct impact on the product, it does have a direct impact on their ability to move their products. So for all intents and purposes, the product's no good if you can't move it and sell it. So I'd really like an opportunity to discuss that with you sometime in the very near future or a member of your staff. Uh, the issue of, of wild line, or, uh, uh, the wildfires in the West, we, we know this is not a, something that uh, uh, may happen. It's a matter of when it happens. And, uh, and of course, in my district, where the where the uh, base for the C or for the 146 uh, Air National Guard that provides a tremendous amount of uh, support for fire suppression in the entire West. In fact, we have 13 new MAF units coming online uh, to uh, work in the C-130s and four new J model C-130s, which should go a long way. Uh, in the interest of time, as the chairman said, we do have an acoustical problem. We have a lot of folks uh, here. I, I do have some questions uh, with uh, unanimous consent I would like to submit to the record for Chief uh, uh, Cosworth and also for you, uh, Madam Secretary, and uh, uh, on the fire issue. And uh, in the interest of time, then I would uh, uh, defer back to, to our chairman. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the unanimous consent, any objection? No objection. So order. Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, just sort of following up on my uh, introductory remarks and uh, recent statements uh, by the administration regarding uh, the uh, Northwest Forest Plan uh, 
And if you or either of the uh, two gentlemen uh, on either side uh, of you would care to answer, I mean, what, uh, what is under uh, consideration for the Northwest Forest Plan in terms of revisions? Uh, is there a possibility of concentrating on restoration forestry and forestry activities in, in areas that are uh, uh, previously managed and uh, now uh, badly uh, in need of, of, uh, of thinning and ho hopefully uh, something that could be done less uh, controversially but will cost uh, some money? Well, I think um, certainly this issue of how we manage the forest is an important one and one that I covered, I think, in my opening statement that um, we do believe that we need proactive management, that we need to be looking at uh, and we're doing uh, a, 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 a comprehensive uh, look at where the priority areas are in terms of, of thinning the forest, of taking out uh, the biggest um, um, issues in terms of, of fire, uh, fire risk uh, and risk of, of large wildfires. And, and so I think that overall it's important uh, as we look towards the thinning issues that we, that we actively manage the forest and we are doing that uh, and working closely with the Department of Interior as we do this. And um, as to the Northwest for Forest Plan, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Ray to comment uh, quickly on, on the status of that uh, particular issue. Thank you. Mr. Ray. Each of the agencies that's involved in implementing the Northwest Forest Plan has nearly completed a review of what needs to be fixed in order to make the plan work. We expect the results uh, back to us in probably a week or two. Once we have those results, I think we have a basis for discussing with you what sorts of changes need to be made. We've talked before and, and I'm, uh, I'm interested in pursuing some of the uh, ideas that we've discussed. Uh. Well, I thank gentlemen, as I pointed out to you in one conversation, that, you know, perhaps you could, uh, you know, there is a, sort of a unique but very fragile opportunity here with, uh, that I see to, to bring along a substantial uh, body of environmental uh, groups and uh, some parts of the industry on, on a new management uh, regime, particularly in dealing with areas like the Coast Range. It is delicate, it has to be approached, and it has to instill a good degree of confidence, so I, I, I'd be happy. Uh, to have those discussions with the gentleman, but obviously any uh, revisions or major changes in the plan that are proposed would be need to be done, you know, through a public forum and, and uh, uh, with the full cognizance of, you know, the protections of the law and NEPA, whatever would be required for those sorts of changes. So, and, and I assume that's, I see your... You that's, know. that's all, that's all correct. Okay. Um, if I could, uh, Madam Secretary, just uh, as a... Uh, uh, a, a famous former member said all politics is local. I, was, I recently was conducting a town meeting. This is a very minor issue. I just bring it to your attention. Don't ask for a response now. But um, I have had concerns about uh, Wildlife Services, former Animal Damage Control Agency, and in particular uh, in one urban interface area, we have had now two incidents of uh, uh, where uh, these uh, M, uh, I think, 80s or 40s, whatever, they the, the little the cyanide shot shells uh, that are attached to meat baits. Uh, have been placed uh, without proper signage, uh, in fact, uh, perhaps uh, in one case without the consent of the property owner, and in two cases, uh, uh, dogs, uh, pets have been killed, and one woman whose dog had been killed and died very horribly came to one of my last town meetings. Uh, I made an inquiry on her behalf as to the facts regarding the matter because we think there is a particular problem employee. Uh, and was told uh, to buzz off, uh, file a FOIA if I want any information about what happened. I, I find that extraordinary. The agency cited some sort of a precedent having to do with a case in Texas, and the last time I checked, we're not in the Texas circuit. So even if there is some sort of uh, precedent or injunction pending in that circuit, it doesn't apply in ours. And I, I found that fairly extraordinary to, to get that sort of response. And I will direct to appropriate member of your staff uh, it, uh, the uh, the letter I sent and the response I got because uh, I mean the constituents obviously distressed I don't want to see another occurrence could be a child the next time I mean with this sort of a practice and I, I'm just very distressed about it if, if uh, just uh, my time seems to be going very quickly but if I could uh, just uh, on the roadless uh, policy uh, we have a, a huge huge uh, backlog of uh, deferred road maintenance in the Pacific Northwest and I know that's common throughout the entire system and uh, 
I, I'm concerned, uh, you know, I'm supportive of the, uh, the uh, uh, roadless policy as promulgated by the past administration. I'm concerned that, uh, I mean, one of the many problems that we're trying to deal with in promulgating the roadless policy, in addition to the idea of uh, the controversy and the environmental problems of entering roadless areas, was to begin to deal with that backlog. Uh, would, could anybody comment briefly on that issue, how, how your proposals or what you're doing with the roadless policy? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, to comment on that. First, let me say that um, the, the, the backlog that you're talking about in terms of our, um, of our, of our road uh, maintenance as well as facility maintenance, maintenance is about $6.8 billion, which is a lot of money. We're looking for a lot of ways to deal with that. I don't believe that, um, that the roadless issue really affects that one way or the other a whole lot. We're not going to be building new roads into roadless areas with or without the uh, roadless conservation plan. Most of our forest plan, uh, existing forest plans, did not call for a lot of road construction into at least half those roadless areas. So I don't, I don't really see myself that those things are really closely, closely aligned. I believe, and, I, and I've heard the Secretary state a number of times, that we do want to protect roadless values. And so from my perspective, it's how you go about doing that in a way that, that is satisfactory to people um, local people as well as people across the country. And so in our effort to try to sort through this, we're trying to make sure that we are able to involve local people in a way that I don't believe they're involved in the, uh, in the original roadless conservation rule development. What we have done is we've gone out to, uh, th with an advanced uh, notice of, of rulemaking and uh, we had like 10 questions or several questions that we asked the public to respond to. Um, to give us some different ideas on how we might be able to deal with, with the roadless issue. Um, we're evaluating those, doing the content analysis now, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to work on that. We haven't built any roads into any roadless areas um, uh, since the roadless rule was adopted, uh, other than roads that would have been allowed for under the uh, roadless conservation rule anyway. And um, there is the Roads Working Group that's sort of a self-appointed working group that we've been, uh, been collaborating with that is that's also looking for ways to pull people together. Roadless areas are important, and we need to have a, 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 a more of a collaborative approach to solving the issue rather than, rather than the kind of uh, resolution that leaves peop some people on the outs and other people on the in. We have to find a way in a collaborative way to resolve that problem. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I, I wouldn't, I will follow up, Chief. I'm curious because you did quantify saying half of the plans wouldn't permit. And I'd I just be, if, if you have a, a listing or a breakdown, I would be curious on getting that. Yeah, we can give you uh, the numbers on, on the existing forest plans or in place when the roadless conservation rule was established on, on how many of those areas um, were designated to, they were basically, I would not allow road construction in them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, I might add, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty deeply concerned about uh, what I've just heard from Mr. DeFazio in regards to a freedom of information demand made on a typical inquiry by a congressman. I would, uh, and Madam Secretary, maybe you have a comment there. I, when we talk about cooperation, it would seem to me that only as a last resort for some legal technicality would a member, an employee of the Forest Service, say to a congressman, go through a Freedom of Information Act. Madam Secretary, I think it's important enough for the whole committee to hear this. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm very concerned about what was stated as well, although if, if we're talking about wildlife management, um, this was probably not a Forest Service issue. This is an APHIS issue. And um, uh, my experience in, in, in California is that these programs are run in conjunction with the state. So we will look at this and determine uh, what the problem was, I mean, certainly I, I would not condone this kind of behavior by employees either and if they're not cooperative, but we will want to look at uh, who was actually involved in the incident, and we will do that. I commit that to you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, and I admit, Mr. Fawcett, your staff and my staff, we both have had this experience on the links survey recently where we asked for the investigator's report, and they just said, file frame information. I can't believe we work with the same agency sometime, work as partners, but I'm confident in your leadership. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary Veneman and Chief Bosworth and Under Secretary Ray, I appreciate you being here today. I want to associate myself with the comments of the Chairman about Forest Service employees. Uh, I think those in Idaho that I've uh, been associated with and working with uh, over the last few years, particularly when I was uh, me and my chief of staff went up on the Clear Creek fire in, uh, in the Salmon Chalice Forest in the year 2000 and, and really met uh, 
Forest Service employees from all over the, the country that were there fighting this fire. Uh, I think they're dedicated employees that are doing a tremendous job. Obviously, there are, there are uh, sometimes exceptions to that, uh, as was pointed out with the Lynx uh, study and a few other things like that. But on the whole, uh, I've been very impressed with the employees in the, in the Forest Service, and I, wanna, and I want you to know that. Um, there have been some comments today about the, the administration and their lack of environmental policy and the lack of implementing the road rule and a few other things. The previous administration developed the roadless rule in cooperation with a few environmental groups, including the Heritage Forest Campaign, the Wilderness Society, uh, the National Resource Defense Council, U.S. PERG, uh, the Earth Justice Legal Defense Fund, the Audubon Society, and the Sierra Club. These groups had continuous communications with and access to federal employees uh, that were directly involved in the creation of the rulemaking. This access was not only limited to the meetings, but included providing draft language, legal memorandum, and survey data to the administration, which was then used to justify uh, and frame the roadless area rule. What will be the current administration's uh, position on involving more people and trying to rectify this one-sided uh, input that was uh, done by the last administration on development of this rule? Well, I think we can <laughs> uh, clearly reiterate that it is, it is our goal um, with regard to managing public lands and certainly our goal in the USDA and the Forest Service to involve local communities in local decisions. On, and uh, uh, we are looking at the roadless rule as part of the uh, um, management planning process for the forest. And uh, we, are gonna we are going to involve um, local input into those decisions. Um, we think that's a very important in whatever decision we're making, um, but uh, certainly uh, it, is, uh, it is one that we think is an important process with regard to, the, to looking at the roadless areas. Let me um, also reemphasize, as I did in the opening statement, that this, uh, contrary to the, the advertising and the commercials that have been on TV that have seemed to be taking after uh, the administration, that this uh, roadless rule was... Uh, uh, gutted by a judge, not by the Bush administration. This judge is the one who uh, issued the injunction against the implementation of that roadless rule. I understand that has been appealed uh, to the Ninth Circuit, uh, that decision, and the judge in that case has not uh, decided whether those appealing entities uh, are, uh, can actually be a, uh, a party to appealing that suit, uh, the environmental groups that appealed that, because they were, what, friends of the court uh, when, they, when they were originally uh, part of that suit. Uh, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that uh, that is under appeal, and I just want to i say this for emphasis again, because I know that the chief just, uh, just answered that. How many commercial uh, logging operations or trees have been sold or cut uh, in the roadless areas since uh, the roadless rule proposal was put into effect? Again, it's my understanding that um that there have been no roads constructed in any inventoried roadless area that would not have been allowed for under the, under the roadless conservation rule itself. Thank you. Uh, there have been members of Congress who have proposed codifying uh, the roadless rule. Uh, their argument is that the administration won't implement it, uh, won't defend it, and so uh, they're going to codify it in statute. Uh, in your opinion, would this be a wise thing to do? Would it, uh, would it uh, interfere with the progress being made by the uh, Forest Roads Working Group in trying to, to uh, come to some compromise on, uh, on this roadless rule? Well, I think it would do a couple of things. One is, uh, uh, obviously, the, the courts, the federal judge has, has uh, um, issued a preliminary injunction on this rule uh, because, uh, according to the judge's opinion, it didn't apply to, it didn't comply with NEPA. So if you were to then codify something that was not in compliance, according to a judge with NEPA, it could override NEPA. And I'm not sure that's an intended consequence that the Congress would want to, uh, to pursue. Um, but um, I, I think it would also undermine um, the work of, of the working group. Um, there, it is so much better to try to make these kinds of decisions by consensus of various interested parties. And I think in uh, moving forward with an ANPR on roadless, uh, as we have, uh, moving forward to discuss the uh, issue, as we've said, we want to maintain the value of roadless. We want to do it in the right way, however. I thank you for your testimony, and uh, I think most of us here on the committee agree with you on the value of the roadless area and maintaining that, uh, that uh, 
unique, uh, important aspect of our force. Thank you. Mr. Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to also welcome the panel and thank you for taking the time to come up to the Hill today. Um, Madam Secretary, I note that the uh, purpose of the hearing was the future of the Forest Service, but uh, we're certainly talking quite a bit about the present day challenges we face. And I wanted to uh, direct uh, my comments and questions, in particular at the wildfire danger we face in the West. And Chairman McGinnis uh, articulately talked about the challenges we face there. He uh, has been working in his own right on some important aspects of the coordination among the agencies. Uh, my colleague and uh, also happens to be my cousin, uh, Mr. Udall from New Mexico, and Congressman Heffley uh, joined together in a letter to you uh, earlier, I guess today's the 1st of May, so earlier in April, um, encouraging you to really focus on the wildland urban interface, or what we call in Colorado the red zone. I wonder if you've had a chance to uh, review the letter and uh, if you have any reactions to it. Um, I'm not, I, I have to say I'm not familiar with that particular letter. I, I, uh, it's not as if you just get a couple of letters every day, so I understand. No, we get quite a few. <laughs> same, same in our office. Well, let me, let me uh, build on my comments about the red zone, and I just wanted to uh, make an appeal to you and to the chief that uh, we do all we can to lessen the controversies that, uh, that could lead to appeals or litigation uh, and then would in, end up slowing down the progress we could make. And uh, I think, in, in part, if we concentrate on these areas that are eroded, where we have this, this interface, um, we, we can uh, do the job that needs to be done, particularly when it comes to uh, hu the risk to human life and, and human property. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that it's extremely important that we look uh, at the areas where, where human life and property are most at risk as we look at actively and proactively managing the forests, as we've talked about. And uh, we're certainly committed to do that. And the Forest Service has been engaged in looking at all of the areas that are in need of uh, more proactive management, particularly with uh, re regard to uh, brush removal so that the, uh, the risk of wildfire is lessened uh, and that people are protected. The um, interagency council, what, what do you have in mind uh, for the council and in particular regard to, to this red zone situation that we're discussing right now? One of the things that the council will be involved in is selecting priority areas for treatment. So that, that was part of the reason to form the council, to make sure that where we have mixed ownerships, both interior and agriculture, that we're coordin coordinating our fuel reduction efforts. Mr. Undersecretary, um, th this may not be accurate, but um, I had run across a quote attributed to you where you had said logging is the best thing for the environment and fire suppressed forests, and I want to give you a chance to comment on that. But I, I would like, to, before I let you comment, I want to make just the point that I think that uh, raises for a lot of people a, a red flag and uh, that what we're really trying to do, and I, and I think uh, Congressman DeFazio spoke uh, eloquently to the point, is reduce fuel loads. And in many cases, the fuel loads are small diameter trees, brush, and those other kinds of materials. And uh, I would further add that I think we have enormous opportunity to create some new rural economies with biomass and alternative wood products. And I'm very, very supportive of that as the co-chair of the uh, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Caucus in the House. And uh, there are a lot of people excited about this possibility if we can help create these markets in these rural areas. W would you comment about that general thrust and then this uh, comment that's been attributed to you? The, the comment was, I think, incomplete. There are a number of tools which, in combination, we need to use to reduce hazardous fuel loads. One of those is prescribed burning. Some places we can't use prescribed burning, either because of air quality concerns or because the fuel loads are so high that controlled burning isn't, isn't possible. Mechanical reduction um, through either logging contracts, if there's material of commercial value there, or through service contracts, if the ma material isn't of commercial value, are also useful tools. Neither of them is magical in any particular respect. Where we do have commercial material there, 
there is something of value that we can exchange for the service that we're getting. And that means that we can extend our dollars a little further. But I think it's important for people to appreciate that the magnitude of the effort before us is so great that we ought to try to speak to one another directly and honestly and not worry that there's a hidden motivation behind what we're doing. I think we've been pretty forthright in saying we believe that there is a role for the national forests in the, produ in the production of some measure of wood fiber to meet America's needs. The level is something that needs to be worked out on a case-by-case -case basis. There's no number anywhere that we're striving for. So given that we're that up, that we're up front about that, I, I would hope that when we do approach together with our counterparts in the Department of the Interior, state and local agencies, the fuel reduction problem, we can do so honestly. We're not trying to reduce fuels to create logs to put into sawmills. We're trying to reduce fuels as fast as we can, using as many tools as we can, before more people are put at risk from wildfire. I hope, Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired, but I know Mr. Mr. McGinnis and I are really concerned that we direct these efforts into these areas in the red zone where people and property exist. And in the end, we want fire to be returned to the forest because it is a natural part of the ecosystems. But if we were to see that fire uh, develop in a lot of the forest now, it becomes catastrophic. I thank the chairman for... Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, uh, Chief, Mr. Undersecretary, thank you again for your work and your comments. Uh, my first question obviously goes to the Klamath Falls situation, and given the uh, funding in the Farm Bill, I'd be uh, appreciative to know what it is, M Madam Secretary, you think you can do to help. Uh, you know, we'd hope to get uh, more earmarked funds. Uh, we succeeded because of Chairman Combest and Chairman Hanson in getting $50 million uh, specifically earmarked, but there's hundreds of millions of dollars there. My second question would involve uh, the Medford tanker base and to get on the record an assurance that uh, if certain things are done, uh, that, that indeed we can keep that base open. And, and Chief, I, I know you're familiar with that. And then I, I just have to ask about the low timber yields and some stewardship contracting issues as well. As you know, in the Farm Bill, um, we'd hope to be able to expand the use of stewardship contracting. And it was the, the Senate conferees on the other side of the aisle that nuked that provision. I'd be curious to know about um, your views on stewardship contracting as relates to the forest. And certainly in my district, I, Mr. Ray, you were, you were out there in John Day. I remember reading a, a report about the sustained yield in the, in the Mallet here was somewhere in the order of 200 million board feet in, in uh, a while back. That was projected. Last year, they hit 10 percent of the projected 38 million board feet. 10 percent of that's all they got out. You know, if you calculate that out, just to put in perspective what's changed in a rural area, we're down to less than 2 percent of where they were uh, a couple of decade, decades ago or so in what they're able to access. And the point I'm, I, I would get at, because Mr. Udall sort of raised this issue to a certain extent, and I'm one of the co-chairs as well and very supportive of biomass and all, but I'm continuing to hear, Chief, from my regional foresters that they are very concerned that we're losing the remaining infrastructure in terms of mills and loggers and, and such to be able to do the kind of stewardship contracting, to, to do the kind of work that has to be done, whether you call it logging or thinning or, or just trying to make our forests more healthy. So I will, uh, I, I will stop with that and then just flag one other agriculture-related issue, and that's sudden oak death, which is afflicting our nursery business. It's a big scare in the area, and we may need some help getting some funding uh, to, to deal with that. So I, I, I know that's a, a rapid-fire progression, but we don't get much time to ask questions. I think questions, you're going to so. win the prize for the most questions in the shortest amount of time. Thank you, Madam Secretary. <laughs> Try to make the best use of my opportunity here. <laughs> let me answer some of them, and then I will turn others over to my colleagues. Um, let me start first with the Klamath Basin. As you know, uh, I was out there recently with Secretary Norton as we turned on the irrigation water for, uh, for this year for the farmers and ranchers in that area, and we were very pleased that Mother Nature cooperated this year enough so that we were able to do that. We have... Um, I, I will also say that that trip gave me a very good feel for the issues in the region, for um, the layout, for, for the, the kinds of, of competing demands um, 
that uh, that is only possible with a first-hand look, and so I was very thankful for that opportunity. Um, as you also know, the President, um, after he visited Oregon with you and uh, Senator Smith, did form a cabinet-level task force to oversee the issues of the Klamath Basin. I am a member of that task force. It's chaired by Secretary Norton. And we, we are working very diligently to look at all the options. There are many competing interests, not j just farmers and fish, but there's tribes, there's national forests involved, there's um, um, obviously the Bureau of Reclamation. There are uh, numerous uh, areas that are involved in this, I this issue, and that's why it's so important that we have this co cooperating task force that includes, at the Cabinet level, myself, Secretary Norton, and Secretary Evans. Um, we haven't seen the final uh, details of the Farm Bill, but I can tell you that we certainly appreciate your efforts to try to get specific, um, to get specific amounts of, of or designations in the Farm Bill to deal with the Klamath issues. And we will work with you and other members of the delegation uh, in Northern California and Oregon to uh, try to utilize the resources that have been given both in the Farm Bill and that we have through other programs to do as much as we can for the Klamath area. Um, will, will you, may, you clearly, and I know the President understand, this has got to be one of the major priorities of this country because if, if we can't fix it in the Klamath Basin, we're not going to be able to fix it anywhere. So, I mean, are you willing to make this and do you think your, the President's uh, committee will make this a, a number one priority when it comes to accessing the billions that are now available in the Farm Bill once we pass it for conservation well, and yes, water? Yes, this, I mean, this will certainly be a priority. I mean, we've got, as I indicated, the President's established a cabinet level task force, and we will be looking uh, um, at this as a priority as we look at the issues in the Farm Bill. Again, it's very difficult to commit specific resources because we haven't I seen the details, that. but. Uh, certainly, I will commit to making this a priority and say to you that it already is a priority for this administration to deal with this issue. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let me also make another comment on the Farm Bill because you raised the issue of the stewardship, uh, the forest stewardship program. Uh, we are also disappointed that that was not included. Um, as I indicated, however, this is a Farm Bill that has the largest amount of spending for conservation ever uh, in a Farm Bill before, and we are pleased about that, but there are things like this program that were not included that could have been a very important program in terms of overall fuel reduction, for example, as we are talking about earlier. Um, this, is, this is a Farm Bill of compromise. Uh, it is a Farm Bill where every, not everyone got what they wanted, um, and certainly this is one of the programs I think we would have both liked to have seen, but uh, unfortunately it was not included. I, I do want to comment on, on the uh, alternative uses in the biomass, uh, which was also asked in the previous question. As I indicated in my opening statement, I was able to uh, uh, visit just last week uh, on the occasion of Earth Day our forest uh, research lab that's looking at a number of these opportunities for uh, forest products, particularly um, some of the smaller cuts, uh, some of the recycled uses. Um, biomass is another important renewable uh, re energy resource that we have from the forest. We're also looking at a number of agricultural uses with regard to biomass. Uh, it is a priority. It is a priority that uh, uh, we have placed in terms of in the administration, not only in our energy plan to look at uh, mm -hmm. renewable resources and biomass is one of those, uh, renewable fuels as well. Um, and, uh, and also these new and innovative discoveries. And I, and I would commend to this committee anyone who uh, uh, has the opportunity to visit this forest products lab and see the innovations that they are making with regard to new uses for forest products uh, there in Wisconsin. It's, it's very interesting, and I think it would uh, give everyone a good opportunity <laughs> to see what technology can do to help us in these areas. I, I would also, Madam Secretary, commend to you the Oregon Institute of Technology Renewable Energy Center as well because they are doing some impressive work on geothermal and solar and other fuel cell development uh, as well down in Klamath Falls. And uh, next time you're down, maybe we'll get you there. I would very much enjoy visiting that. 
Um, as to, uh, we are sensitive to the point you made also about losing the infrastructure in, that supports the forests, and uh, certainly that is an issue that I think needs to be addressed as we work with local communities and get local input. This needs to be put into the mix of the, that, that discussion. And finally, we do have as a focus uh, sudden oak uh, death syndrome. It's a big issue also in California, and we're working with a number of members there as well. Um, I, I'd like to turn it over to the chief uh, to talk a bit uh, about the Medford issue and, and, uh, and the logging uh, issue. Let me, let me uh, add, we've gone over our time considerably here, and we do want to give the other members the time. So if the chief would visit with the representative after the meeting in further response to this question. Mr. Udall? No, that's okay. okay. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Veneman and um, and company here. Uh, I, I wanted to address this issue of, of focusing and targeting um, uh, national fire plan monies uh, specifically uh, to the urban to, uh, wildland interface. And, and it seems to me as I've watched this unfold that, that we seem to, to have such a broad definition or such a, a expansive view of what the uh, wild and urban interface is, is that we're doing a lot of reduction in backcountry areas, we're doing a lot of reduction in areas that don't need it, and, and in my opinion, we really need to target um, very specifically what is uh, um, a wild and urban interface. And on uh, April 11th, uh, I wrote you about the legislation that, that uh, Congressman Hefley and my cousin Congressman Udall had introduced, and, and in that legislation, we take what the GAO has done and try to urge you and your council to very specifically uh, define uh, uh, urban wildland interface. And, and specifically there, we talk about uh, a definition. This is a definition that's used in the Rocky Mountain area uh, where uh, we would talk about first uh, homes and other structures that are immediately adjacent to or intermixed with federal uh, public lands containing flammable vegetation. Two, that the conditions on such lands are conducive to large-scale disturbance events. And three, that there is a significant probability of a fire ignition and a resulting spread of the disturbance event. It, it seems that, it, that definitions are being used all over the country. And if you read through the GAO reports, you see California has one definition and then the Rocky Mountain area has one. And, and I would urge you, I think, to get this focused, you and the chief and the undersecretary. Uh, it, it may well be from your level to, to try to uh, define what it is we're talking about so that we can spend these monies in an effective way, we can measure what it is that, that um, we're getting in terms of spending money, and so we don't uh, reach the situation where we get to the end of this and everybody says, well, the National Fire, fire Plan is a failure. I mean, that's what, what I really fear, being a Westerner, is that, that um, we know that an incredible amount of work needs to be done uh, and if we don't do it well early on, that the, the support out there will disappear for um, continuing the National Fire Plan and specifically trying to address these, these high-risk communities. And with that, I'd uh, love to hear from you or, or um, either of the two individuals you have with you. Well, I think you bring up very important points, and, and uh, part of the reason uh, or that, that Secretary Norton and I together signed this agreement uh, establishing this wildfire council um, just uh, early, or just, well, it's May 1st, last month, uh, was to address these kinds of issues, to look at how do we best um, create the definitions, how do we set the priorities in terms of where we need to, um, to, to uh, first uh, um, uh, put the resources, and certainly the, the urban interface is one that's, uh, that's very important and needs to be addressed. Um, Mr. Ray, I think, uh, um, indicated earlier um, that uh, the, the council is going to be meeting just this afternoon, and uh, some of the definitional issues are things that this council will be addressing. Do you want to comment on that further? 
I, th I think that's pretty much it. Could I, could I come over? I'd like to just uh, just make one comment, though, about the uh, wildland urban interface areas. One of the things I think we have to be very, very careful of is to not assume that a wildland urban, urban interface situation in California is the same as it is in Georgia or is the same as it is in Wisconsin. We have to look at the local situation. Fire behaves differently in those different, those different circumstances. The fuel loads are different. The kind of treatments that it takes to, uh, to deal with those fuels are different. I think that we need to keep our focus on protecting communities and, um, and, and recognizing that, of course, those are the higher cost areas to treat as well. We've got to keep our focus on, on the communities, but, but uh, be very cautious about, about one definition that would, that would cross every place in the country. You know, that may not work. We just need to make sure we think that through very, very carefully. Chief, Chief do you have any, in, in hearing me read this definition that I think is used in the Rocky Mountain area, and, and uh, uh, the, the last two conditions on such lands that are conducive to large-scale disturbance and events, there is a significant probability of fire ignition and resulting spread of the disturbance event. It seems to me that that, that kind of definition is something that could apply uh, all across the board because what we're looking at is, is large-scale uh, devastation. That's what we don't want and we need to be targeting the monies to those areas that are at the highest risk. Isn't that where we, we should be headed? Yeah, uh, Gentlemen, I hate to interrupt. I'm sorry, Mr. Young, but I got five other people in 20 minutes to would you, Can we just let him just give a brief answer, oh. Mr. Chairman? He is a very concise gentleman. Yeah, Mr. Peterson, he's going to, I'm he's turning the floor. Mr. Peterson, you have to leave right. Mr. Peterson needs to leave. And uh, it's either give you more time What's or cut that? these guys short. I wanted short. to give the witness more time. five to one, so you're outnumbered. I'll Mr. come Peterson, back. Mr. you may proceed. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to welcome you, Secretary and uh, Chief and uh, Mr. Ray, uh, for joining us today. And uh, you have difficult jobs, uh, a lot more difficult than a lot of people think. Uh, I, I would like to just begin by saying um, I come from northern Pennsylvania, the finest hardwood forest in America. I grew up in the forest. Uh, when I was a youngster, I slept in the forest. You can ask my mother oftener than I slept in my house in the summertime. Uh, and I, I grew up alongside of oil wells uh, because I was from the original oil patch where Drake, near Drake Well. So uh, we had oil activity, we had timber activity, and it's a beautiful forest today uh, uh, because we managed it. Most people managed it well. But I, I, I guess I would like to comment just for a moment about the ranking member's comments when he hits you with 10 issues that he thinks this administration has failed on. Uh, it's my view that you had to somewhat stop um, policies that were not well thought out, uh, policies that were from the radical left, uh, policies that had devastating impacts on the economies of rural America. And so by slowing them down and, and allowing public input in my view, you have proven that you really are interested in the environment uh, because, uh, in my view, uh, the Vice President's office should never have managed the Forest Service, and in my view, they tried to. Is it not true that today we market 84 percent less timber than we used to on an annual basis? Uh, it depends upon the time frame in which you're talking about. Um, but we are marketing substantially less timber You're today. You're less than 2 billion board feet. It used to be 12 billion per year. That's the figure I'm going on. And, and we've never met our mark yet, so it's, you know, it's going to be less than 84 percent from what we used to. But, but I think we have to realize that those who are against marketing timber want it zero. And they want all public land to be for the critters, not for people. Uh, because in my view, when you look at the roadless areas, uh, and, and I would doubt that if a quarter of a million Americans would spend quality time in a roadless area out of our vast population. People don't go. I'm an avid hunter. Avid hunters don't go a mile from a road, the majority of them. They just don't. The few young that understand the forest and are not afraid of getting lost. When you go roadless, you go peopleless. So not only does timber and other activities stop, recreation stops for most of America. Yes, yes. And I think that's a debate that's not been had, in my view, as a part of this process, that when you make an area roadless, 
you make it peopleless because people won't go there. They just don't. And I guess I wanted to make the point that in the Forest Service, as you manage the forest, you have range biologists, you have soil scientists, you have hydrologists, you have fish biologists, you have wildlife biologists, environmental engineers, insect and disease scientists, and forester, foresters, botanists, civil engineers, economists, and social scientists that help you make your decisions. Is that a correct statement? I don't think the public gives you credit for that. I don't know of any agency that brings in that many highly educated professionals to analyze every decision you make whether it's a timber cut, whether it's a trail building, or any activity that you're going to allow in the forest, those people interact. Am I not correct? That's correct. That's correct. And, and so, you know, I guess my message is, in, in, as we talk about analysis paralysis, you know, if I was a business person, and I, I have been previous to being here, and I had that kind of scientist backing me up, I would be less timid defending what I'm doing than the Department of Agriculture and the Forest Service has been in the last few years. And that's the situation you've inherited. But I mean, you have a lot of very well-educated professionals helping you make every decision. People who worry about fish biology, people who worry about wildlife biology, people who worry about soil scientists, I mean, hydrologists. All of those professionals are a part of your decision-making process, and I don't think you get any credit for that, or take any credit for that. Would you like to, any of you, respond to that? Well, Congressman, I think that's a very important point. We do have a very diverse cadre of professionals in the Forest Service that help uh, with all the determinations we make with planning, uh, with determining how we're going to manage the forest, uh, and they uh, are a very important part of what we do. Um, I think it's also, part of your comments also go to what we have referred to as the analysis paralysis, the difficulty in getting decisions made. Um, as, uh, as we've indicated on numerous occasions, so much of what we do ends up in the court system. Uh, that has been a real problem, and we, uh, we are looking through what the chief through his leadership, he is looking at, a, at a, a, a report on what is it that is holding up decisions and the decision-making process, no, and then he wants... I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, members, we've got to keep it within the time limits. We've exceeded that time limit, and uh, Mr. Peterson, as you know, you, you were granted the courtesy by these other two to jump ahead, so... Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, I'm sorry, Madam Senator, but I know you're trying to get out by noon as well. And uh, so, Mr. Norwood and Mr. Norwood, thank you for allowing us to jump and uh, to. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for allowing me to come and uh, ask a couple of questions today. I, I, my inclination is to defend the political attack that occurred earlier today, and I'm not going to do that. But I would say to you, Madam Secretary, that there are many, many, many Americans who have increased trust in this administration and are very pleased with the balanced, common sense, fair approach uh, that our president is taking. So uh, just because it doesn't agree with somebody doesn't mean a lot of us aren't real happy with it. I want to associate my thoughts with the chairman's opening statement and with yours, Madam Secretary. I couldn't agree more. And there have been so many important questions. I hope I'm not going to trivialize this, but uh, please do understand my questions are based on I'm trying to stop a war. Uh, all of us are getting new districts, and I'm lucky enough to get uh, seven new counties in North Georgia, the most beautiful mountains in the world. And the interesting part of it is that 50% of that land mass is the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest. So the people who have lived in those mountains for years and years and years have a great interest in what your supervisors do in that area. Uh, my first question, and please quick answer, is who does the supervisor answer to? The forest supervisor reports to a regional forester, and, and in that case, it would be a um, person by the name of Bob Jacobs, who is in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I'm going to come talk to you in later, and we'll get into real details, but it, finally, it kicks up to you, doesn't it, Chief? And he reports to me. Okay. Now, uh, the Secretary said that it was very important that we have strong ties to local communities. 
the secretary said we have to involve local communities in local decisions. Frankly, my question is, does that mean the local community gets to put in their uh, point of view and everybody listens and then the supervisor does what they want? Or does it mean it really does have an effect on the decision? The, the reason for uh, working with both local communities as well as people outside of the local communities, the region of people that are um, in some of the, the cities that have an interest on the national forest is to try to, try to arrive at decisions based upon their input and others' input, uh, decisions that will work on the land, that will, that will be okay, satisfied. Here's the, people. the deal. And, and the reason this is important is I'm trying to stop a war in a district I'm not even in yet. Uh, I, I want to know what the policy is of the Forest Service when it comes to ATVs. Can you use an ATV in a forest road or not? Um, that, that would depend on the individual forest plan. So there's a forest plan for the um, Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest and uh, the forest plan sets out, and every forest has a, has a, pl a forest plan that sets out the direction for, um, for what can and can't take place. So and in some parts of America, you can ride down the road on an ATV and other parts that you can't, yet it all belong to, belongs to us. There are some places that there would be some restrictions um, uh, for ATVs, partly from safety standpoint. There may be places where you uh, have the potential for, um, for faster vehicles going down a road and you have and you have, uh, say, an ATV, um, that, that there's, there's the potential for accidents and for... Well, death. there are potentials for accidents on interstate highways, too, but we don't prohibit cars. And Clara Johnson, the supervisor down there, is trying to prohibit ATVs, and it is going to start a war, and I want to know how to stop it. First of all, I don't appreciate her trying to take ATVs off the road. Now, I don't think they ought to get off the road into the forest, but, you know, this is land owned by the people and many of my people like to go trout fishing maybe some of them even like to go bird watching some of them may want to go turkey hunting some of them are not old enough to climb the mountains but could get up there and enjoy their land and i want to know what do we need to do to have some local input that will be meaningful well i need to talk with the uh, regional forester and the forest supervisor on that particular situation because again we atvs are a part of the national forest recreation opportunities um, all across right. the country um, like any other any other use we try to work together with local people as well as others to try to to try to figure out how we can do that in a compatible way um, to satisfy as many people's desires as possible so so, uh, and I can't speak specifically to the, to the situation you're talking about, but I can certainly check into it and get back to you. And, and I want to talk to you specifically about it outside of this hearing room because you and I have to divert a war. Well, I don't want any wars on national, over national forest lands. I don't think you do either, and I don't want one in my new district, but I'm telling you, I know those mountaineers up there. I do know that, and I also know that as good of employees as you have, everybody agrees with that in this room, some of them are political appointees. And my time has expired. Time has expired. Time I, it's not, I just want to, I just want to, but excuse me, I just want to correct that. Our four supervisors are not political appointees. Our, our deputy chiefs, I'm not a political appointee. I'll show you how it happens when we meet. All right. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> we want to avoid a war in this committee room, too. Let's go to uh, Mr. Gilchrist now for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I had a solution for, for Charlie's ATV problem. I think that people down there should just use horses. <laughs> They enjoy the wilderness a little bit better. It's a lot more quiet. And a lot of different birds eat that dung. It's good for the ecosystem. Um, I want to, uh, uh, Chief, I just want to tell you that my daughter's ecstatic. She has a student job in one of your farms for the summer. That's great. She'll love it. I, I, I don't want to say in public where, Tell you know. No. Well, it's near Butch, but uh, it's a great spot. Um, Madam Secretary, thank you for coming today. Um, we do, and I want to confirm the fact that uh, when you became Secretary of the Forest Service, people feel a lot more comfortable and they feel secure with your pragmatic, reasonable, visionary approach to both agriculture and, um, and, the, and the forest land. I come from, a, from back east. That's an unusual thing for this committee. Uh, not too far from here, just stones throw away in Chesapeake Bay. Live on a peninsula called the Delmarva Peninsula, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. 
and we have uh, pr predominant uh, industry there is agriculture and fishing. Uh, and there is also some conflicts between the people on, on agriculture, silviculture, and the fisheries because of habitat uh, reasons and so forth. We have in the Farm Bill, and I hope to God it passes tomorrow, a pilot project um, in the conservation title. I think it's 203, letter G, called the Conservation Corridor. And it will bring together the five key areas that you've described, in my opinion, uh, by making um, agriculture unique, value-added, profitable, so farmers will have the option to stay in farming because they, can, because they can or to sell their land. Right now it's becoming they can't. Uh, they only have one option. That's to sell their land if they want to um, keep their house or send their children to college. The other part of that bill, and that's a contiguous corridor of agriculture. The other part of that bill is a conservation corridor. Now that's, for the most part, a forested corridor. Now we don't have a lot of national forest on the Delmarva Peninsula, but uh, the, the Department of Agriculture can go a long way into helping create this conservation corridor by the ideas that we have in the three-state area to make agriculture profitable. Create a conservation corridor, mostly a forested corridor, that fundamentally follows the hy hydrologic cycle. Um, by doing that, you reduce the conflicts between agriculture, the fisheries, forest practices, wildlife habitat, and clean water. Um, we think it's a fundamentally sound approach. It's a pilot project that will last five years. Uh, in three years, the mix to see whether or not it is successful uh, will be reported to Congress. It is a totally voluntary program. Anyone that participates uh, or decides halfway through their participation can back out with any, without any repercussions. It brings basically the myriad of agricultural programs that are out there, mostly in the conservation arena, uh, which are very often fragmented. One county doesn't know what another county is doing, let alone one state to another state. But we have a region uh, that will take advantage of the, the vast array of of resources and expertise uh, that Mr. Peterson rec uh, mentioned uh, to bring to bear in this one region. If you look at the Delmarva Peninsula, it's like, perhaps it's like um, a heart or an organism, and it has veins and artery arteries that proliferate that particular watershed, and that's the area that we're looking for the, for the conservation corridor. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention, and I hope we can meet um, shortly after the Farm Bill's passed and pull all this together. Well, we will look forward to working with you on that. I'm not, pr I'm not familiar with that particular provision. However, this sounds very much like our Conservation Reserve Enhancement Programs, where we've been very successful in working with states, in particular watersheds, uh, to, to build uh, uh, quarters of, of planting and so forth to enhance water quality, to keep people in farming, uh, and to overall enhance the environment. And I think these kinds of programs are extremely successful. They're the kind of programs we've talked a lot about um, as we've discussed the importance of having conservation programs that help with working farmlands that keep farmers in business. And so we will look very much forward to working with you on this project. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Now we'd like to recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Otter. Well, thank you Mr. very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Undersecretary and Madam Secretary and uh, Chief, uh, thanks for being here once again. It's been a great experience, educational as well as very informative. Uh, Chief, uh, the, I, I understand the, the, the process that uh, we're going through now to review the actions of those folks that were involved in the Canadian Link Study, and I don't want to belabor that, but I would like to make a point in the process of answering questions. And Madam Secretary said that the individual involved was retired. Now, my understanding is, is that was the, that was the uh, person that actually came forward with the truth and said that, uh, that in fact they had falsified that study and he was retired, uh, and he w had retired. Uh, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I only want to, I do want to make this point, uh, that during the Clinton years, uh, 38 lumber mills were okay. shut down in, in my state. Uh, and uh, all of those folks didn't get a chance to retire. 
Uh, they lost their jobs and they lost their benefit programs and eventually, in many, many cases, uh, their family had to uproot generations of living in a particular locale and move someplace else because their economic, the economic vitality with the closure of uh, the forest and with the closure of those mills was no longer possible. And so uh, while me, we might celebrate the fact that we have indeed gotten rid of somebody who was a problem in terms of true science and using true science to drive uh, our good intentions, uh, I just want to remind you that those individuals will probably all have their retirement, they'll have their continuing government package of medical benefits, and for the most part their families are going to remain intact with their generational roots. I wish I could say the same about uh, in excess of 8,000 Idahoans uh, who are not uh, in their locales and in the, in the pleasant circumstances under which a government employee uh, retiree might be. During uh, the process of, uh, of your opening statement, Madam Secretary, you mentioned the existence of some advisory groups that were made up of a uh, that were actually a compilation of all of the driving forces within a community, the stakeholders, uh, and trying to come up with a plan, trying to come up with a process which they could all agree to and go forward with. Uh, how much authority will these do these people have? Is this simply advisory? And if, uh, I guess my question goes back to the one by the gentleman from Georgia that after these 65 advisory groups complete uh, their work, are they going to get to celebrate probably the, the beginning of a, of a new idea about managing uh, the resources of which they all had a say-so in and eventually all agreed to? Uh, is there any authority attached to this process? Well, let me first say how much... Um value we put on this local input uh, for, and from local communities in making these decisions again. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Ray to comment specifically on these advisory committees. These are committees that were chartered under the Secure Rural Schools and Communities Bill that passed in the last Congress. They have the responsibility of reviewing and, and approving investments in projects on the national forests and they have in the aggregate about $25 million of uh, money available for that purpose. So yes, they do have specific authorities. And when the plan is finished, when they can come together and, and work things out, uh, this, is, this then has some authority, this has some resolve for implementation? The, some of the advisory committees have already approved plans that are being implemented with the funding available. Right. In addition to the funding that is available through the bill, uh, which is a mandatory uh, expenditure, some of them are also matching uh, the federal funds uh, with state and local government funds. It's our hope that these committees will, over time, even take a somewhat broader role in providing assistance and advice to the Forest Service. They're Bef balanced committees by statute. Before my uh, time runs out, uh, Chief, I, I wanted to mention a couple of names to you. Um, uh, and I just met with Brad Powell yesterday. He came in, in my office and introduced himself. And uh, I'm quite encouraged by his appointment uh, to uh, District 1 and to uh, Jack Troyer uh, in District 4. That's a good signal uh, for getting folks that truly understand the resource uh, rather than having political agendas uh, back on the ground and back in the operating, uh, uh, back in an operating, actually operating the uh, resource. So thank you very much for the Thank you. The gentleman has expired. We go to the, the gentleman from California, Mr. Radonovich. I thank the esteemed chairman. Um, welcome. Secretary Veneman, it's uh, good to see you here. I was just thinking a little bit earlier, you might be a constituent of mine with the California reinforcement. If that's the case, it's an honor. And uh, We're uh, close. <laughs> do want to thank the administration's balanced approach. I know that the, the issue of balancing uh, uh, preservation with multiple uses is a, is a tough one. And uh, despite what was said here today, I, I want to uh, state it, that, that as one who's an advocate of increased multiple use, I share my frustration in not getting what I want as fast as I want. And uh, uh, a case in point would be uh, the Sierra Nevada Forest Plan Amendment that was recently adopted. And uh, 
Uh, I, <clears throat> I am disappointed that, that it was adopted, and I do have some questions referring to that, but I also understand your necessity to recuse yourself from the, from the issue um, and perhaps might want to direct this at your call to uh, Mr. Ray. But uh, I am kind of withholding judgment until uh, the regional forcer develops an action plan to execute Chief Bosworth's directive and would like to state on record that my understanding of what might be accomplished in that. Um, uh, one would be to re-examine the framework to find ways to continue to lower the risk of catastrophic fire while uh, providing and protecting resources. Number two would be better coordinate the framework with the priorities of the Herger-Feinstein-Quincy Library Group Act. And number three, uh, to better assess the impacts on recreation and grazing communities uh, this, this plan amendment might have. Uh, what is the timeline, if you've got any comments as to whether I'm correct or not on what's going to be researched, but also what might be the timeline that we might see something come back that we can take a look at? Yeah, we, were, we set out to, to accomplish that in one year. Um, I can't remember the date that it started from, but it, when, when, I, when, uh, when I issued my decision, we were, we were expecting to have, a, have this, uh, this review completed in the region in a year. Um, and you're pretty close, I think, on your on your understanding in terms of the of the direction that I gave. The region, the regional forester, has developed a, a plan. He has a team in place. Um, I believe they've broadened it somewhat to take a look at a couple of other aspects. But they're they're going to work with uh, interested people and and evaluate that and make the appropriate changes. Will you be consulting with members of Congress and and related uh, agencies, local governments, tribes, environmental groups, as you begin to to go through this process? The the Particularly the, um, the regional forester will be doing that, and then I will to some degree as needed. But the, yes, uh, we will be dealing with local communities, already are, um, with, uh, um, with interest, interest uh, groups on all sides of the issue. I believe that with many of the um, congressional staff, uh, so uh, yeah, that it's going to require a lot of public uh, interaction and, and uh, comment and involvement. Super. Chief Bosworth, did, do we have an idea of when that year is up? Do we? I'll have to get the day. I can't. I just. I can't, I'm not recalling quickly, um, unless one of my. I think it's December here. of this year. December of this year. Okay. Good. I look forward to that. This last year's all run together for me. I can't remember when I did what. <laughs> Thank you. The only other thing I want to mention, uh, 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 is since the hearing is regarding the future of the United States Forest Service, I want to hold up for the cameras a, a chart that I came across just recently, which was very alarming and it speaks a lot in and of itself. And it's a, it's a little bit dim on this side. It's hard to see, but this is a chart of that charts the number of acres burned in the Intermountain region due to forest fire from the 1930s up to present time. I think it's 2001, from 100,000 uh, acres to a million acres. And it, I, I noticed the dramatic increase since what looks to be like 1987 from 2001, the dramatic spike in number of acres burned. And I think that while we're trying to assess the future of the United States Forest Service and their and their management practices on public land, I would think that one of the questions you might want to ask is, why are we burning six to ten times more forests every year than we have in the last 70 years? And would like to provide this to you uh, as evidence that we might want to take a second look at our forest management policies. Uh, but with that, not required comment, and if you w would like to, though, that'd be just fine. But, uh, but I thought it was an interesting, to, interesting thing to point out for the hearing. Well, I think that uh, certainly we are looking at the, the whole area of uh, wildfire management, uh, as we've indicated through our uh, partnerships uh, with Interior, with uh, our whole fire management plan, and uh, the, the committee that's going to meet this afternoon uh, of the USDA and the, the Interior Department, the various agencies that are involved, uh, to look at these issues. And I think uh, uh, certainly uh, that, that uh, chart would argue that uh, we need to aggressively look at uh, how we control fire risk much better, uh, which is why we're talking about active management, with, about fuel reduction, mm -hmm. and about how do we uh, best protect um, the forest for all of the users of those forests. Very good. Thank you very much. Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. For the, this will be the final round question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your courtesy. Thank you for staying to accommodate this. I really appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Rodonovich brings up a really interesting question about fire loss. And I just sort of uh, editorially note that eight out of the, of the 10 hottest years in recorded human history were in the last decade. Uh, we're experiencing this global warming uh, um, trend, which I believe many scientists believe has 
prospectively some impact on our forest fire danger. I, it's one of the reasons I hope we can join to do something about global warming at some point. Um, I was asking you earlier uh, about this trust issue with the agencies and their difficult decisions. And one of the issues that's caused great concern in the Northwest is the administration's decision uh, not to defend the roadless area rule that was adopted after this, the, the largest amount of public input in American history in any rule, one point some million comments, 95 percent of which were in favor of a very strong roadless area bill. And yet, uh, and the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Ashcroft, promised the United States Senate during his confirmation hearings that he would indeed defend that roadless area rule if, if and when it was challenged in court. Then in the Idaho litigation, he essentially took a dive and refused to defend that rule, and that's causing great concern out in the Pacific Northwest. And I'd like it, if you can, to tell us who made that decision in the administration not to defend the roadless area bill contrary to the specific promise by Mr. Ashcroft, be it you, the President, Mr. Ashcroft, who made that decision? Well, first of all, I don't think we agree that the rule was undefended. The Justice Department mounted an aggressive, albeit unsuccessful, defense at the district court level in Idaho. The Justice Department is today defending the rule in pending legal action in North Dakota and in Wyoming in cases that have not been stayed as a consequence of the Idaho preliminary injunction. After losing the decision at the district court level, the Department of Justice and the Department of Agriculture, which is the client agency in this case, had to review, as the Department of Justice and its client agency does in every instance, when we lose a district court decision, what the merits of trying to reverse that loss on appeal are. What goes into that evaluation is, is it likely to, that we're going to succeed at the circuit court level, or are we likely to fail? Is it necessary to continue the defense to achieve the objectives that we set out when the secretary and the chief announced their support for protecting roadless areas. The conclusion of that review, we believed that is the Department of Justice and the Department of Agriculture believed that it was highly unlikely that we would prevail in the appeal. The Ninth Circuit has ruled in similar cases before when the government has failed to adequately comply with NEPA. Indeed, the last time an administration tried to do a national roadless rule was in the Carter administration and it was reversed by the Ninth Circuit for almost expressly the same reasons that Judge Lodge has so far reversed it. So I think we've defended that rule as aggressively as we, w we could, given the legal infirmities uh, that the rule unfortunately uh, possesses. Well, let me just say that uh, I hope that we prosecute these cases against terrorists with a lot more vigor then you assert we defended this rule worth in the Idaho courts. It was laughable. And the American people deserve better when, in fact, there's been an affirmation that the rule is going to be defended by the Attorney General of the United States. And it's this type of conduct which causes you difficulty in the performance of your duties to win the trust of the American people. And that's what I'm talking about today. Now, one of the things I ask you about trust and how to win it back from the American people, I was hoping that you would have talked about the Tongass area specifically in, in your work on the roadless area bill. I was hoping that because I've heard that the administration intends to pursue a course that would allow subsidies of roadless or, or roads being built in roadless areas that have been inventoried in the Tongass and allow foreign sales if there's no uh, viable domestic market. If you can tell me that is not true, I'd love to hear that and I'd love you to tell us uh, what your plans are on the Tongass, please, in regard to the roadless bill, the roadless rule, excuse me. The, the Tongass is under its own separate litigation. At present, the judge has agreed not to enjoin those timber sales that are currently operating. Those are sales that would have operated even under the Clinton roadless rule because they were grandfathered by that rule. As a result of that litigation, the Forest Service is currently conducting a wilderness review, and it will 
go through a revision of its forest plan and complete that wilderness review, which will decide which of those roadless areas are going to remain roadless and which may be put back into multiple use. The vast majority of land holdings in the Tongass National Forest, 16,300,000 acres of the 17 million acres of the forest, are not used for timber production and are presently roadless. Just briefly, if I may, could you address the foreign sales issue, Mr. Ray? I don't, I don't believe there are any foreign sales on the Tongass. There are some species that are not used by the domestic producers which remain on the Tongass, um, yellow cedar and to a smaller extent red cedar. Some of those logs are exported both to the Pacific Northwest mills as well as uh, to some mills abroad. But they're not, selling tim they're not selling timber sales to foreign bidders. Those are all American logging and manufacturing companies that are bidding on the sales. Thank Gentlemen. you. Thanks for your courtesy. Gentlemen's time has expired. I would uh, conclude the hearing with my own five minutes, uh, a couple more questions, and I want to give uh, Chief Bosworth an opportunity to uh, respond to my question about the Medford uh, tanker base. As you know, the Quartz Fire burned over 6,000 acres of federal, state, and private land in Oregon last uh, summer. Fire had initially been forecast to spread to 28,000 acres, but because we were able to get in and do the initial attack, because of the close proximity of the tanker base in, in Medford, the fire was contained to 6,000 acres, which saved the taxpayers and the Forest Service $28.8 million in fire suppression costs. In light of these savings and the fact that 55.9 percent of the quartz fire occurred in the Rogue River National Forest, doesn't it make sense for the few hundred thousand a year to keep, us, to keep that base open uh, to do that as opposed to run the risk of a fire getting away from us that could cost $28 million? When, uh, when we're determining where we want to where we want to keep uh, air tanker bases, um, we look across the across the across the board and try to figure out um, exactly where the fire frequencies are, where where the, the length of time it takes to reload and to um, to do the initial attack with air tankers, uh, where the closest reload bases might be, and and our folks go through a fairly heavy evalu evaluation. Also recognize that there's that there's uh, all limited. Um, dollars to uh, to do the improvements at some some bases that need to be done. I know that uh, in this particular case there's been a lot of discussion with local folks and there's a, a, a big concern from people in Medford about whether or not they'll be adequately protected. Um, I know also that the Regional Forester Hard Forestgren has worked with with uh, your staff and others and I believe have my understanding is they've uh, they come to some some agreements that that we would be able to uh, there's some dollars involved but but uh, in the event that we're able to achieve, achieve those dollars, uh, that, that we would keep it open. The, in the meantime, uh, we will have a, a reload facility there, and, uh, I'm, and I believe that that reload facility will work very well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ray, uh, you were out in John Day, Oregon, with Senator Smith at a, a timber meeting, and you've seen what's going on out there. You've talked to the, the folks that are so uh, in such desperate straits. One of the issues that we've run into is this Bestia report. And as you know, Judge Haggerty ruled in favor of the plaintiffs in a suit against the Forest Service for its failure to cite the Bestia report when preparing the Hash Rock salvage sale. And again, that's a few hundred acres out of what, how many thousands of acres that were burned um, that we're trying to, to get in there and get cleaned up. Can you talk to me about, uh, are, are there other uh, studies out there that can be referenced? Why wasn't Bestia referenced? How, what's it take, and this isn't necessarily a criticism, but what's it going to take to to prepare a timber sale that can withstand a, a court decision? It seems to me there ought to be some template. Will your charter forest concept help us get to the, the goal of better, healthier forests, better managed forests and product for our mills? Possibly, but I think we are, we are going to have to continue to improve uh, our ability to articulate our objectives and de develop complete decision-making documents uh, because I don't think that the uh, environmental litigants who are challenging us are going to go away. We, uh, before we came up here, we took tally of how many legal actions the Forest Service is currently involved in, and the number is over 5,000. So we are looking at the Bestia report and, uh, and uh, potentially may 
augment that report and make sure that our line managers have a complete understanding of all the things they have to evaluate and disclose in the decisions they make. I, I had a regional forester a few years ago tell me in my office that in order to replace the steps on a lookout tower, which of course a fire lookout, top of a, of a mountain, they had to do an aquatic study. Now, I don't know about many walking fish or climbing fish, but that seemed a bit absurd to simply replace the steps. And she went on to say that, that there's some 99 laws, rules, whatever they have to uh, try and keep track of when they do anything. And, and the Forest Service employees, a number of us have commented what dedicated people you have. And, and again, we all have people in this Congress and any occupation that we might disagree with their tactics or their ethics, but people I've met with in almost every instance have been just stellar. But I also have sensed as I've gone around, more and more people in the service are, are feeling a bit demoralized that no matter what they try to do, somebody sues and it, you just never get it done. Is there a way that we could go back and sort of recodify it without reducing necessarily the environmental standards? But just to get to a system where we can move things through, you know, in, in the Malheur, I know it took three years, three years just to get through to, to, to harvest trees that had been burned in a catastrophic fire. By the time they got in, because they were pine, they were all blued. The value for the taxpayers had gone from 30 million to a million. If, 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 if we were on a real board of directors here, we ought to be sued by our, our taxpayers for fiduciary irresponsibility. Is there a we, way? I, mean, I think we are being sued by them. Well, you yes. <laughs> All right, we're back in court. Is there, is there any way to break through that? The, I think that the, the first next step is the report that the, the Forest Service is preparing for the chief uh, and that will be the subject of subcommittee hearing on the 16th, I believe. And what we hope that report provides you is our best diagnosis of what the problems are in our rules and regulations in some of the statutory requirements. And with a good and fulsome discussion of that, uh, I believe we can then move forward to work on some solutions. We're, we already have some things, some administrative things in progress, um, but I think that's the next first good step. Because I've seen, uh, I've been out after some of these fires in the forest with some of your people, Leslie Weldon and others, uh, out in the Deschutes, and I, they took me through where we had been in and actually done some, some thinning. I guess that's a politically correct term. I don't know anymore what to say, but that's what happened. And where they hadn't, and it was a, a clear line right down the forest. And on the side that had been treated, even some of the underbrush was surviving. The lodgepole pine, some of it was going to die, but most of it was going to survive. And the ponderosa was, was going to make it just fine. And literally, you could walk to the other side. The soils were scorched. The underbrush was gone. The habitat destroyed. The lodgepole, mostly all would die. And a lot of the ponderosa would die. And I don't think people all over the, this country of ours understand what's happened in the West, that we've suppressed fire for 100 years. We've gone in heroic efforts to stop forest fires. Smokey the Smoky Bear. I'll get it right, not Smokey the Bear. Smoky Bear. You know, we've all said stop forest fires. But then we've also stopped any management of those forests in most cases. And so it's just like a garden where you never weed. And so when the fire does hit in these hot, hot summers, it's catastrophic. And I, it troubles me because that's not good for the environment. I, I think it was in either this hearing or one in the Ag Committee a, a year or so ago had photos of a stream where a fire had raged through a catastrophic portion. And it was... It, it looked like it was snow, and this was taken much later after the fire. And yet it was that dust that you sink down to your knees in, and that's the habitat left for the fish out from these stream banks. And I don't want to see that happen. I realize we're never going to go back to the cuts of the 70s or 60s or whatever. That, that, that's not even on the table. But somewhere we've got to find a middle ground, as my colleague Mr. DeFazio was talking about, or you're going to have enormous blowdowns. And, and destruction and disease. And I know the chief has spoken quite eloquently about the, 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 the gridlock that you're running into. And chief, do you want to weigh in on this or Madam Secretary, I, whatever you want to do it? Well, I, I can't uh, re ever resist the opportunity to, um, to comment about the problems that we have in terms of our, of our process. Um, 
and and it is very demoralizing for our folks in the field to uh, to work hard to do good things in the ground. And it's not as it was often people are are, are believing that it's caught that it keeps us from harvesting timber, but that's all. No, it keeps us from from improving fish passage, from replacing culverts, from from uh, doing good travel planning so that we can designate off-highway vehicle trails uh, so that we can get the off-highway vehicles off the cross-country and onto designated trails. Uh, every it, every um, so when you project go to, that... So when you go to replace the culverts to make them more fish-friendly, fish you're getting we still have food? to We still have to go through many of the same processes. We still have to go through consultation processes. Uh, and it's not that, that that stops it necessarily. It's just that such a large percentage of the dollars that we get go to doing all the planning and the analysis and um, and then we get less culverts re replaced. And so um, it's my objective is to is to review these processes and review the way that we're managing this internally because we got to take some of the uh, some of the heat on this and fix some of our management processes. But uh, look at all the other processes that we're dealing with and and, and make a process that works for the public and, and where we can get make good decisions right. on the ground in a timely way, um, so that we can be an organization that people will point to and say that's an organization that's good government. Well, I think that that's a, a, a very forward-looking way to approach it because it, it's not to cut off public discussion or to, to tilt necessarily even tilt the scale one side or the other. I mean, I've got my biases; people know that. That's fine, but it just seems like we get caught in gridlock, Madam Secretary. Well, I think that's. Uh, you've made a very strong case for why it's so important to actively manage our forests. Um, whether it's protecting against um, more, more catastrophic fires, I mean, the active management of a forest, it's proven, uh, is, is truly beneficial from an environmental standpoint. It helps protect against the catastrophic fire, it helps to protect habitat, it helps to protect the trees. Uh, and I think we've seen numer numerous examples of this, and it is, it is truly our desire to find a way so that we aren't so b bound by this process gridlock that we can't do the job that needs to be done for all of the public to better preserve the forest, because that's really what we're talking about. And I think oftentimes we think uh, we, we aren't really considering the fact, uh, as has been brought up, by people on both sides of the aisle today, that we uh, we need to actively manage to protect communities, to protect uh, forest-urban interface, to protect the forests themselves, uh, because the losses will be so much greater. And and to in the process of doing that, involve local communities and find ways to allow these decisions to be made in a in a in a timely manner, so that we can do the best thing. Uh, in the most expeditious way and in the most protective way for for uh, all that are concerned. You know, there are some great organizations out in, in my district and in my state where they've got the, the tribes, environmental community, industry, you know, local elected officials. I think of the Wallowa Resources up in the Wallowa Na National Forest, Wallowa Whitman. Um, I think of the Deschutes Resource Conservancy in, in Central Oregon, um, the Applegate down in Southern Oregon. There are these groups that have come together on the ground to say, let's figure this out and make it work. And I, that's why I'm hoping as you explore this idea of other models to go to to actually improve the environment. That's, I mean, we Oregonians are pretty proud of our environment, and while we may have our differences in the in the uh, how we work that out, at the end of the day, we want clean water, we want fish in our streams, but but we also recognize need for agriculture and timber. And I'll, uh, nobody else is here to complain about me going over five minutes, but I, I just feel so passionately about we can have good clean water, we can have restored fish runs, we can screen, and in the Klamath Basin, you saw what's down there. We've known about the need to screen that those canals for a decade. No, but it just doesn't happen. It's expensive, we get water, people ignore it. Now we've got funds in the farm bill, we'll have funds in other ways. And, and with this administration's drive, and I know firsthand having flown with the, the president, that uh, he is tenacious and uh, he, he, he wants this solved. And he wants water for the farmers, but he also understands the Endangered Species Act and, and understands the need to have healthy habitat, too. And we can, that's the interesting thing and the incredibly vexing challenge in the Klamath Basin is if we 
satisfy the ESA, and if we restore healthy runs, we'll have water for the farmers. And that's why I was so pleased that, that Chairman Combest included our, our study of fish passage at Chiliquin Dam, 95% of the habitat of the suckers blocked by that irrigation dam. The Irrigation District and the Klamath Tribes worked with me on that legislation, and we're, that's going to move now. And in a year, we'll know whether you take the dam out and pump water or can you do better fish passage. Get that resolved, you know, it's, that, it's one less thing that, that blocks the survival of, of the sucker. And, so anyway, I, I know you have a very busy schedule. I'll, I'll draw this to a, a close. And, uh, and again, thank you uh, for, for your initiatives. The record will be open for 10 days for members to submit questions to the secretary. And again, we, we appreciate the tough challenges you face and the, the friendly attitude and tenaciousness that you face it with. And, and thank you for being here. And thank you for the work you're doing for our country. Thank you very much. The hearing is closed. We're in the uh, 1836 Old State House Museum in Little Rock. It's the uh, oldest state capital in the uh, west of the Mississippi River in the United States. It's a national historic landmark and uh, one of the proudest buildings in the state of Arkansas. The Old State House holds one of the largest uh,